We're doing everything wrong. People are unhappy with the things they want and not happy with the things they try to avoid. I feel sorry for us because we can't even tell the difference between good and bad. No one will hold this against us though because we are all in the same situation. In fact, we will be urged to stay ignorant at every turn. Few people are wise though. They know that nothing is good beyond what is necessary and that nothing that fortune controls is to be feared. They stand out. After listening to this video, you will also be able to stand out. So keep listening to my voice, because this might change your life forever. Seneca says that you will not be limited or in need if you choose to follow these wise people and separate yourself from the crowd to become wise yourself. You will be free, safe and ignored. Nothing you try will fail and nothing will stop you from doing what you want. Everything will go the way you want it to. Nothing bad will happen to you. Only what you expect and hope for will happen. No misfortune will occur. That's how the Stoic Sage is described. They are like the awakened figures of Jesus Christ or the Buddha in their own religions. Using virtue perfectly and consistently is what it means to live a good life. Even though this might be a bit too far away to reach, it is a good goal to work toward. Even though no one can reach perfection, it seems likely that some of us could get most of the way there and that most of us could make real progress in the right direction. Seneca the Younger, whose full name was Lucius Aeneas. Seneca was a Roman politician, actor and author who wrote a lot of Stoic works. Both his life and death were very interesting and his many works have helped us learn a lot about Stoicism. Letters from a Stoic, on anger, on benefits, on the shortness of life and of a happy life are just a few of the works that give a lot of useful information and psychological thoughts. As we learn more about the way to knowledge, we will use Seneca's lessons to help us find our way. What is Stoicism? Any way of thinking that sorts our values and points us toward the most important ones is called a philosophy of life. We could give in to selfishness and chase joys while escaping pain without a purpose, which would lead to a life of regret. Seneca said that we all make mistakes because we only look at parts of life and not the whole big picture. The archer has to know what he wants to hit and then use his skill to aim and control the bow. Our plans fail because they don't have a goal. If a person doesn't know what port they are going to, no wind is good wind. Stoicism is a philosophy of life that holds that you can live the best life possible by using reason to lead the most virtuous life possible. It is a way of living that life. It is not just something to learn. It is an active, useful way to live every day. Stoicism is a philosophy that can be studied in a classroom, but to really follow it, you have to be aware of your thinking and the world around you all the time. If you want to be a Stoic, you have to follow these rules in every part of your life and keep trying to live the philosophy instead of just thinking about it. What do the Stoics think? The Stoics valued reason, but they still believed in a few things. The first thing they believed was the Logos, which is the idea that the world is a place of order and understanding that can be reached through reason. The second thing they thought was that people are social by nature and were born to be with each other. This idea, which may seem simple at first, has greater meanings as we learn more about it. Also, believing in some kind of God is a good fit for Stoicism, but it's not necessary. Modern ideas like pantheism or Spinoza's God were a lot like the Stoics' thoughts about God. They thought that the world was God and everything in it was its body. Everything that happens has a perfect reason for happening and you worship it by going with the flow of nature and being tolerant of everything. Our reason is holy and a part of God's reason. Our job is to make that part of us better. There is no set future. When we die, our souls leave our bodies and either go somewhere else or return to their basic forms. 
We don't go with it either way, though. And Epictetus thought this was a very important part of how philosophy worked. Accepting that everything that happened was part of this divine plan was a big part of how they dealt with and got through life's problems. These days, people often call this amor fati, which means love of fate. It's the idea that our lives and presence are good in general. If everything happens for a reason, then we shouldn't just accept what happens to us. We should love it as part of the plan for life. And this is a more holy version of Stoicism that can really help you feel strong. On the other hand, Seneca, who wasn't radical, didn't stress this perfect order as much when he talked about how Stoicism works. He stressed living well regardless of fate more than enjoying it. What does virtue mean? The Stoics used their minds to figure out the best way to live, and they came up with the four cardinal virtues – courage, knowledge, justice, and moderation. Even though they don't ignore other virtues, it is their unique way of looking at these that makes up the core of Stoicism. There will be more on each of these in one of the parts that follow, but for now, here are the short versions. Being wise means dealing with only the things you can control. Being fair means treating everyone like family. Temperance means limiting your wants to what you already have. Being brave means getting over your fears. Having these core virtues leads to what Seneca called tranquility of mind, which is a deep peace and mental stability. What does peace of mind mean? A mental state known as tranquility of mind, also known as peace of mind, is defined by the absence of bad feelings. It's not about not having any feelings, being disconnected or not caring. It's about feeling safe, loved, thankful and free without worry, regret, anger or hate. The amazing idea that we can live the best lives possible by acting in the most virtuous way possible is the great finding of Stoicism. This understanding isn't just an intellectual idea, it's a fact of life that if we live by virtue and reason, our lives will be happy and peaceful, no matter what luck has in store for us. Stoic Mindfulness It's not accurate to call Stoicism Western Buddhism, but it does have more in common with that philosophy than with the Judeo-Christian faiths that came after it. The practice of mindfulness, which involves being aware of one's thoughts in the present moment and being able to focus one's attention, is at the heart of Stoicism. We must act wisely and virtuously right now because it is the only thing that truly exists. Ignoring the present is like giving up on life itself because there is no promise of what will happen after this time. Right now, we need to be present and virtuous. Objective judgment, now at this very moment. Unselfish action, now at this very moment. Willing acceptance, now at this very moment. Of all external events, that is all you need. Before we can work on the virtues, we need to do some exercises to improve our ability to focus on the present. Stoic practice. Meditation. There isn't a practice in Stoicism that is exactly the same as meditation, but Seneca probably would have taken it up fully if there was one. He wrote many carefully thought out pieces. Inability to change and endurance are both enemies of tranquility. The mind must be turned away from outside things and toward itself most of all. It should believe in itself, be happy with itself, respect its own things, stay away from other people's things as much as possible, and focus on its own things. Let it not feel losses, let it see even bad things in a good way. Meditation is such a useful and easy-to-do tool that it should be included in any attempt to show a true version of Stoicism. Even if you only do it for 10 minutes a day, simple breath meditation can be very helpful. You can use a meditation app or just sit quietly and focus on your breath. If you find that your mind wanders, slowly bring it back to your breath. A lot of people are confused about what meditation is and how it works. Not only is it not relaxing, but it's also not hard. 
Having a clear mind doesn't help with meditation. It's when you become aware of being sidetracked that it helps. It's hard to keep your mind on the breath the whole time, so the best meditation is the kind where you quickly catch yourself thinking about something else. You improve your mindfulness and stoicism each time you pay attention and reflect. The eyes of the Roman people is a stoic habit that comes straight from the writings. Seneca will explain it better than I can, but the key idea is that when we are alone, our morals tend to slip. This is what you should do instead. Act like someone is always watching you. This works best if you picture this person to be someone you respect a lot, like a wise guide or a person with strong morals who makes you want to live up to their high standards. This is how Seneca put it in Letters from a Stoic. Do everything as if Epicurus were watching you. It is definitely a good idea to have someone watch over you and whom you can look up to as a witness to your thoughts. It is much more honorable to live your life as if a good man were always with you. Still, I'm fine with you only doing whatever you're doing the way you would do it if no one was watching, because being alone makes us do bad things. But don't think you're truly happy until you can live in men's eyes and your walls protect you without hiding you. Even though we often think that these walls are there not to keep us safer, but so that we can sin more covertly. I will tell you a fact that can help you judge a man's character. It's rare to find someone who can live with their door wide open. Our morality, not our pride, has made people stand at our doors. The way we live now means that being quickly made public is the same as being caught in the act. Anyway, why should we hide ourselves and stay out of men's sight and ears? A good conscience likes being around other people, but a bad conscience is bothered even when they are alone. Love a man with good character and keep him in your mind at all times, living as if he were watching you and doing everything as if he were there to see it. That, my dear Lucilius, is what Epicurus said. He did the right thing by giving us a monitor and a servant. If there is someone with us when we are about to sin, we can get rid of most of them. The soul should have someone it can look up to and respect, someone whose power it can use to make its own place more holy. The person who can make other people better, not only when he is with them, but also when they are thinking about him, is happy. And he is also happy who respects a man enough to calm down and keep himself in check by thinking of him. If you can respect someone so much, you will soon be respected yourself. Therefore, pick a Cato. If you think Cato is too strict, pick an Laelius instead, who is a kinder person. Select a master whose life, talk, and soul-revealing face have made you happy, and always think of him as your guardian or model. We do need someone to hold us accountable for our actions. You can't fix something that's crooked without a ruler. If we have a witness nearby when we're about to do something bad, the soul should have someone it can respect, someone it can use to make even its own shrine more holy. Someone is happy when he can make other people better, not just when he is with them, but also when they are thinking about him. And he is also happy who respects a man enough to calm down and keep himself in check by thinking of him. If you can respect someone so much, you will soon be respected yourself. If you can fully commit to this method and remember to do it, it can help you stop a lot of the bad things you do. As you learn more about mindfulness and practice it more, it will become easier to remember to act as if someone is watching you. This will serve to improve your mindfulness even more. If you work at this for a long time, you should be able to get good enough at it that you can spend most of your time in the present doing the right thing and being happy. Seneca says that a wise teacher or a well-known public person are good choices for a guide. The important thing is that it should be someone you look up to, someone who makes you want to act with respect, whose approval you seek and who any bad behavior would make you feel very ashamed of. It's important to know that the leaders we choose are not out to get us, even though they do look at our mistakes. 
They make decisions because they really care about our well-being. Not only do they judge us, but they also show us the way, give us advice, and give us courage along the way. Their only goal is for us to achieve our full potential, find freedom and tranquility, and do as much good as we can. They are happy every time we take a step in the right direction. When they are watching, we shouldn't try to do better because we're afraid they won't like it, but rather because we really want to live up to their virtuous ideals. We need to think that they love us. The Olympic Games are another stoic practice that makes sense to talk about here. This one comes from Epictetus. So, before it's too late, decide that the right thing for you to do is to live like an adult who is growing up and letting go of old habits. Let everything that seems right to you become a rule that you must follow. And if you come across something hard or easy, nice or bad, remember that right now is the competition and the Olympics are right in front of you, that you can't wait any longer, and that one day and one action will decide whether progress is lost or saved. That's how Socrates became the person he was. He paid attention to nothing but his reason wherever he went. If you want to be a Socrates, you should live like you are one, even if you are not one yet. Everything you come across is a vital moment, whether it's an event in the world or a thought that is getting in the way. Right now is the only time you can truly practice Stoicism, whether you're just going through the motions or taking the chance to act like a philosopher. These are your own Olympic Games. You've been training for this very moment. You can show everyone what you can do now or just your guide. Now is the moment of truth. You can either rise to the task and embrace knowledge or you can fail and give in to vice. We're lucky that the Olympics happen a lot of times every day. So even if we miss our chance, we will soon have another chance to make things right. Stoics believe that our inner conversations and the stories we make up for ourselves have a lot to do with how wise we are. A type of cognitive behavioral treatment called rational emotive behavior treatment was based on the lessons of Epictetus that have been preserved. It was created in the 1950s. Albert Ellis, who made it, really liked Epictetus's idea that what bothers people is not the things themselves, but how they think about them. A Guide to Rational Living, his book, should be on the reading list of every Stoic. In part two, we will go into more depth about what the Stoics meant by wisdom and how to use it. Part 2. Wisdom, the two sides of control. The difference between control and lack of control is the most important part of knowledge and the main idea of Stoicism in general. This idea tells us the difference between things we can control and things we can't. Stoic philosophy holds that in order to live wisely, we must learn to be indifferent to things outside of our control and put all of our energy into things we can actually control. Epictetus, a famous Stoic leader, said that we have direct control over our thoughts, feelings, wants and dislikes. Contrarily, we should keep a Stoic apathy toward external situations like unforeseen events, misfortune, health problems and accidents. In A Guide to the Good Life, Professor William Irvine slightly improves the idea so that it fits with what we know now about how minds work. He talks about what he calls the trichotomy of control. Irvine says that this system divides things into three clear levels of control, full control, partial control, and no control at all. It helps me to break it down a bit more like this. Full control over our thoughts, goals, and beliefs. All of these things live in my mind, so I have full control over them. Actions, wants, and fears that you have a lot of control over. My acts are under my control as long as I'm not feeling too much passion. Even though my fears and desires are strong, I can judge them and change my mind about them. Not much control, impulses, these happen on the spot and are hard to control, but they can be tamed with practice and planning ahead. No control, what you like and don't like. 
these deeply held tastes are harder to change. Sometimes it is possible, but only after a lot of hard work over a long period of time. The serenity prayer is another well-known form of this idea. It is usually said like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. The Stoics believed that being wise meant being able to tell the difference. The rest of the philosophy tells you how to change the things you can and accept the things you can't. What's good and bad? Once we have a new idea of what we can control and what is good and bad, the next step is to use this knowledge to grow wise. In order to protect our happiness from the whims of fortune, this entails having internal goals and developing indifference to things we cannot control. We need to make sure that our wants are in line with what we can control. Let's look at the earlier examples again to show how this works. If we thought that being healthy was necessary for happiness, we would suffer when we were sick. Instead, we can keep tranquility despite physical situations by getting ready for hardship and telling ourselves our minds are the most important thing. Our main goal should be to maintain our honor and resilience in the face of an unfair sentence, finding meaning even while we are incarcerated, even though we may strongly prefer justice. When the war starts and everything is lost, we need to remember that fortune only lends us things and we can pay them back at any time. We should never give up our virtue and be willing to pay any price to do what is right. It looks like everyone else is going the other way, so how can we be sure that this is the right way to go? We only need to look at the lives of people who worship fortune to see that it is not a solid foundation. When fortune gives them what they want, they are very happy, but that happiness quickly turns into fear of loss and enviousness of those who have been given more by fortune. People cry and gnash their teeth when fortune takes back the things it gave them because they think that getting what they were given back is a terrible kind of theft. No matter what situation they find themselves in, these people will never find tranquility. We need to base our plans on something stronger. When it comes to worshipping virtue, the Stoics don't like worshipping fortune. Instead, they do what Seneca called the superstitious worship of virtue. In the midst of this moral mess, he is writing about how to become a Stoic. Something stronger than usual is needed to get rid of these long-term problems. To get rid of a deep-seated belief in false ideas, rules about behavior must be set by ideologies. Precepts, comfort and support must be added to these before they can work on their own. They don't work if we want to tightly tie men up and pull them away from the problems that hold them fast. They need to learn the difference between good and bad. They need to know that everything but virtue changes names and is sometimes good and sometimes bad. In the same way, a soldier's main bond is his word of loyalty, his love for the flag, and his fear of deserting. Also, once the oath has been taken, it will be easy to give him other tasks and promises. The same goes for people you want to bring into your happy life. The first steps need to be taken in Los Angeles, and these guys need to be taught virtue. Let them be held by a kind of foolish worship of virtue. They should love her, want to live with her, and not want to live without her. The Stoic philosophers said something very bold and different. They said that virtue is the only thing that leads to real happiness. This view goes against the common belief by saying that things we usually want and think of as lucky, like money, fame, power, good health and a good image, don't really matter when it comes to being truly happy. Stoicism also contends that the things we fear and call misfortune such as poverty, illness, shame, exile, or oppression, are not actually bad. A happy life is based on having the virtues of knowledge, justice, temperance, and courage, and living them out. According to them, this road is the real way to live a happy life. 
If you ask most people, however, they think happiness depends on good luck and hope that things they can't control, like job success, relationship success, and health, work out in their favor. This dependence on outside factors usually leads to a short-lived or non-existent sense of happiness, since luck is naturally unstable and short-lived. The Stoics call this way of thinking worship of fortune. Stoicism, on the other hand, calls for a different kind of devotion, a deep respect for virtue from the heart, realizing what is right or trying to act in a way that is right is not enough. Seneca stresses how important it is to love virtue with all your heart, not just understand it. When you truly believe in virtue, it changes from something that could be a pain to something that brings you real joy. Stoics are happy to take on tasks that other people would rather not, because it gives them a chance to show their virtue. Stoics take pride in standing up for morality and truth, even if it costs them a lot. This is because they are dedicated to following virtue. They are able to live happy, fulfilling lives, no matter what is going on around them, because they revere these things. You must truly believe this and love virtue with all your heart, because liking it is not enough. Then anything that has been touched by virtue will bring you blessings and wealth, no matter how other people see it. Even if you are being tortured, you are calmer in your mind than the person who is torturing you. Illness, if only you wouldn't curse fortune and give in to the sickness. In short, everything that other people see as bad will become doable and turn out for the best, if you can rise above it. Look into philosophy first. I'll let Seneca explain this part more than I will. Give your whole life to philosophy. This is all from Letter 72 of Letters from a Stoic, which is called On Business as the Enemy of Philosophy. She doesn't deserve you, but you deserve her. Give each other a warm hug and say goodbye to everything else with honesty and courage. Don't just study philosophy when you have free time. If you were sick, you wouldn't worry about your personal issues and would forget to do your work. You wouldn't trust any client enough to take charge of his case while your own pain was getting a little better. You would do everything you could to get better as soon as possible. So why don't you do the same thing now? Get rid of everything that is stopping you and spend all of your time on getting a sound mind. No one can do that if they are busy with other things. Philosophy is in charge. She sets her own schedule and won't let anyone else do it for her. She's not something to keep an eye on at odd times. She's something to work on every day. She is the boss and she tells us to follow her. Alexander told a certain state that when they offered him some of their land and half of their goods, I invaded Asia not to accept what you might give, but to let you keep what I might leave. Also, philosophy is always telling all jobs, I'm not going to take the extra time you have, but I'll let you keep what I leave for you. But you shouldn't wait to study philosophy until you have time to spare. In order to focus on philosophy, everything else must be set aside. That's why no amount of time is long enough, even if our lives are extended from childhood to the end of time for humans. What happens to philosophy when you stop studying it for a while or don't study it at all? It doesn't stay the same. It goes back to where it was at the start because its continuity has been broken, like how things fly apart when they are stretched. So, we need to fight the things that take up our time. They shouldn't be untangled, they should be pushed out of the way. There really is no bad time to study, but a lot of people don't do it even when they know they should. Make philosophy your most important thing. Your spirit is sick and you need to get better right away. Like climbing a high hill, you can't stop until you get smart. If you stop or hesitate, you might fall back to where you started. So start now and don't give up until you get smart. You have to take care of yourself first if you want to do good things for other people. Because of this pledge, you must always be looking for reason. It takes being very self-aware and knowing why you do everything you do. To follow this road, 
you have to give up comfort and wealth, get over your vices, and always be aware of your own and your loved one's deaths. To live each moment in a way that would make you proud if it were your last, you have to remember that not even the next hour is certain. Philosophy shouldn't be something you do by yourself. It should permeate every part of life and make sure that everything is done with excellence and virtue. Philosophical thinking can help us deal with things like death and pain, and it should help us deal with work, shopping, food, and everything else. This is what Seneca means when he tells us to start with philosophy. Think about and deal with everything else in life through the lens of Stoicism. Writing and reflecting are important parts of the Stoic way of life. In fact, reflection writing is the only modern guide that talks about this practice. Seneca's quote, When the light has been turned off and my wife has fallen silent, aware of this habit that is now mine, I examine my whole day and go back over what I've done and said, hiding nothing from myself and passing nothing by, is often used to accompany this practice. While this is good advice, it does not fully capture the essence of how Stoicism works. Also, you'll notice that Seneca isn't writing in a diary. He's thinking about things inside himself. The fact that he is smart and hasn't lost his attention to technology makes this possible. People like me who have modern brains that aren't very smart will do much better writing things down. So what does this process of thinking do for us? I believe this quote better shows what I mean. I shall keep watching myself constantly, and a most useful habit shall review each day, for this is what makes us wicked, that no one of us looks back over his own life. Our thoughts are devoted only to what we are about to do, and yet our plans for the future always depend on the past. You are more likely to pay attention to your actions and experiences when you know you will be writing about them in a book which pushes you to choose virtue over natural, unthinking behavior. At first, you may find that your diary writings are too general or that it's hard to remember what happened that day. But if you keep at it, your ability to remember things and be present in daily life will get better, which will show that you are making progress in this practice. It's best to write in your diary every night around the same time. Not how you write, type or talk in your journal is less important than the act of writing. You only need 10 to 15 minutes of work every night to keep you on track during the day. When it comes to tasks, we want to think about what we want to learn to pay attention to. That's why I ask, what went well today and what didn't? What else could you have done? What bad habit did you break today? What sin have you looked at? How are you better than them? Write down the good things that have happened to you and why you are thankful for them. Plan how you'll be able to return them later. What was the smartest thing you thought of today? What does Seneca do every day for himself? Get yourself something that will protect you from misfortunes like poverty, death, and more. And once you've gone over a lot of ideas, pick one to really think about that day. It's how I do things. From all the things I've read, I choose one to share with you. Watch how you act and make sure you're always getting better. Never forget to say thank you or pay back people who have helped you. Every day, get rid of one flaw and come up with one great idea to protect yourself from what luck throws at you. All of these things have effects that get bigger over time, like interest that builds on itself. Suppose you did this every day for one month, one year, five years, or even your whole life. What would you be like? Part three is about justice. Most of what the Stoics say about justice is similar to what most people say, but the Stoics put more weight on some things. When we apply the two types of control to the idea of justice, Stoicism tells us something different about how we should act. The Stoics also think that people are naturally social and were born to live together and work together. This gives their view of justice a greater understanding of how we are all linked. This point of view leads to a more community-focused approach to justice, recognizing that we are all responsible for each other and rely on each other. Do not do what is wrong. If it's not true, don't say it. 
Marcus Aurelius was the Roman emperor and a very calm person. He was one of the five good emperors, which is a pretty strong support of the philosophy. Meditations, a collection of his personal works, contains deep observations. One famous quote from these works is, if it be not fitting, do it not. The author wrote them just for himself to think about. If it is not true, speak it not, which is often translated online as, if it is not right, do not do it. If it is not true, do not say it. This perfectly captures the core Stoic principle. Always do what is right and speak the truth, no matter what. Stoicism teaches that the moral honesty of our actions and words is the most important thing, and that any bad things that happen because we stick to virtue are better than losing that honesty. Stoics have shown their devotion to this concept throughout history by often facing exile, torture, or even death. Seneca himself was put to death by Emperor Nero and chose to end his own life rather than give up his honor and be tortured. The idea that tranquility of mind, which is the greatest good in Stoicism, is gained through virtue and lost through its compromise is the reason for such strict devotion to virtue. Doing good things and telling the truth are the only ways to have a clear mind, which is necessary for inner peace. Maintaining virtue is even more important when things are bad and bad things could happen. One big moral mistake it can weigh on someone's mind for a lifetime. Also, Stoicism gives a clear view on group action problems, which can be hard to understand for people who don't have a philosophy of life. This includes issues like the tragedy of the commons or the subtle harm that comes from seeing other people do small, immoral things. According to Stoicism, the right thing to do is based on one's morality, not on what other people do or on a cost-benefit evaluation. A Stoic focuses on acting with virtue and simply does what is right, while others may argue about how their individual actions affect the bigger picture. Interconnectivity There is no such thing as good or bad luck for an individual. We all live together, and no one can be happy who only thinks about himself and turns everything into a question of his own comfort. If you want to live for yourself, you have to live for your friend. The Stoics thought that all people are connected and that we are all born to share our lives with others and help each other. If you treat someone like a stranger, you are not properly connected with them. People who are strangers are more like distant cousins because we share human traits, especially the ability to reason. The Greek Stoic philosopher Hierocles, who lived around 200 BCE, is thought to have first thought of oikiosis. With this idea, our connections in the world are like a set of circular rings, starting with ourselves and going out to include family, friends, co-workers, peers, and finally, everyone else. We have to bring these groups closer together when we use knowledge to do justice. We have to treat family members as extensions of ourselves, friends as family, and strangers as friends. Sometimes we don't say it out loud, but seeing everyone as family, brothers, sisters, cousins, uncles, and aunts, inside makes us better at treating others and changes how we see the world. It changes our point of view from one that is mostly about being alone to one that is mostly about fitting in. This mental shift is a strong way to fight the worry that comes with living in a complicated world with lots of people, which can get in the way of a calm mind. The Stoics knew that their fellow people and themselves were not perfect and that the job was hard while they were saying this. A wise man will never stop being angry if he ever starts, because every place is full of vices and crimes, Seneca says. This sounds a lot like how things are now. There is more bad behavior than can be fixed by penalties. It looks like men are running a huge race of being bad. Every day, they are more eager to sin, less humble, and don't care about what is right or better. It's no longer secret that crimes are being committed. They're happening right in front of our eyes. 
wickedness has spread so widely and become so ingrained in everyone that innocence is no longer rare. It doesn't exist at all. Do guys break the law by themselves or with other men? In fact, they come up from everywhere at once, as if they were following a global signal to erase the lines between right and wrong. A host is not safe from a guest. A father-in-law is not safe from a son. But there is rarely love between brothers. Wives want to kill their husbands, and men want to kill their wives. Stepmothers get ready to kill with aconite, and kids wonder when their sis will die. And how little do these crimes make up of men's crimes? The poet hasn't talked about a people split into two hostile camps, parents and children joining opposing sides, Rome being set on fire by a Roman, dangerous horsemen searching the country for places where the forbidden could hide, wells filled with poison, plagues caused by people, children digging trenches around their parents who were in trouble, overcrowded prisons, fires that destroy whole cities, dark tyrannies, and secret plans to set up in this case, I mean lust, rape, and filth. In addition to these public acts of national bad faith, treaties that have been broken, armies, thefts, scams, and not paying back debt, anything that can't defend itself is taken as loot by the stronger. Four of our current courts would not be able to handle these cases. For the wise man to be as angry as the terrible crimes of men demand, he must not only be angry, he must go crazy with rage. You might think that we shouldn't be mad at other people's mistakes. After all, what do we say about someone who is mad at people who trip in the dark, deaf people who can't hear his commands, or kids who forget their duty and get distracted by their friends' games and jokes? What should we say if you choose to be mad at weaklings for being sick, getting old, or getting tired, among other misfortunes that affect people? Perhaps men's minds are cloudy, and they not only can't help, but love making mistakes. You have to forgive everyone if you don't want to be mad at specific people. You have to forgive everyone. You will be mad at babies, because they will soon do wrong things, if you are mad at young men and old men, because they do wrong things. Does anyone get mad at kids who are too young to understand the difference? Being a person, on the other hand, is a better reason than being a child. So we are born as beings who can have just as many mental illnesses as physical ones. We are not dumb and slow-witted. Instead, we abuse our sharp minds and lead each other to bad habits by the way we act. If someone follows others who went off the wrong path before them, they can certainly get away with getting lost on the highway. You can be harsh with deserters in general, but when an entire army does it, they should all be forgiven. What stops the wise man from being angry? He sees a certain number of sinners. It's unfair and dangerous to be angry over flaws that all guys have. Heraclitus used to cry every time he went outside and saw so many men who were living and dying in terrible conditions. He felt sorry for everyone he met. He was joyful and happy, and his mood was gentle but too weak. He should have cried for himself as well. Democritus, on the other hand, is said to have never gone out in public without laughing because he didn't think men's serious jobs were very important. Where is the room for anger? Everything we see should either make us cry or laugh. The wise man will be mad at people who sin. What's the harm? Because he knows that people don't become wise by birth. Because he has a full understanding of the situations of human life, he is aware that very few wise men are born in any age. Now, no normal person is mad at naturi. What should we say if a person was surprised that fruit wasn't hanging from the trees in the forest or that bushes and thorns weren't covered in useful berries. No one is mad when nature makes up for a flaw. So, the wise man will go out every day with this attitude. Many men will meet me who are drunk, lustful, ungrateful, greedy, and excited by the frenzy of ambition. This means that he will be calm and honest about his mistakes, and he will not be an enemy of sinners, but an improver of them. 
he will treat all of these with the same kindness that a doctor treats his patients. He will treat everyone the same way a doctor treats his patients, by helping them in any way you can and not responding to or criticizing their flaws. The Stoic does this to show how things are connected. What good things does a Stoic do for the world? A common problem that people who are not Stoics bring up about the philosophy is the idea of inaction. Sure, virtue and tranquility of thought sound great, but not if it means giving up on the world and what's going on in it. People get this wrong because when people use the word Stoicism in everyday speech, they only mean the part about controlling your feelings. When people think of bravery and justice, they should remember Cato the Younger, who was the last person to stand up for the Roman Republic against Julius Caesar or George Washington during the American Revolution. But luckily, none of us will have to go that far. Seneca continues his text above with advice on how we should behave. If someone's ship leaks easily through its open gaps, should they be angry with the crew or the ship itself? He doesn't do that. Instead, he tries to fix it. He keeps some water out, bails out some others, and seals all the holes he can see. He then works non-stop to fix the holes he can't see that let water into the hold. Even though he doesn't have to work as hard because the water that he pumps out comes back in, we need to fight long and hard against sins that never go away and spread. And the answer to how a Stoic does good in the world is not to defeat them, but to keep them from taking over. Do we sail in a well-built boat on calm water? From the way the boat is moving and the fact that his feet are wet, even someone who has lost all of their senses would know the answer is no. We live in a time when vices keep getting worse and where virtue is laughed at. So, the good person works to get rid of the water and fix any holds they can reach, while the bad people curse each other, the boat, the crew, or even the gods. Some people see themselves as leaders and think they are in control of everything. Some people call for the water and even dig new holes for it to come in. Anything like this wouldn't come as a surprise to a good person who works hard, knowing that they will have to keep going for the whole trip. How to be a Stoic? Can I be like that too? In the last drill, we looked at ways to improve your attention and become more aware of your thoughts as they happen. This skill is very important for our next activity, which will help you get along better with other people. The main goal of this practice is to train yourself to recognize right away when you start to judge someone. Your goal should be to change your thinking to something more virtuous as soon as you realize you are doing it and to remember yourself that you are both human beings. If you notice someone else being sick, ask yourself, can I be like that too? If the answer is yes, which it probably is, it's easy to stop judging them and instead feel sorry for them. My cousin and I struggle to keep our tempers under control. I'm glad mine isn't attacking me right now. If you said no, it will be easier to stop judging and start feeling sorry for them. You will also be thankful for whatever it is that has kept you from making this character flaw. Being constant with this practice takes work, but it is a strong way to become a better, happier person. It's also a good way to worship virtue in a magical way. When you stop seeing other people as mostly annoying and start seeing them as family who can be difficult at times, you will know you are getting closer to a state of tranquility. Part 4. Being moderate. When it comes to moderation, the Stoics stress discipline and self-control more than anyone else. It is very important that you turn away from both what people want and what they are afraid of. We chase after things like money and fame that we think are good, but they aren't. They go from good to bad and often cost us more than they gain. We need to realize this and stop looking for them. What we fear, like poverty, a bad image, being alone, illness and death, is not evil. It's just something that happens to everyone and is out of our control, so it can't hurt us unless we do something bad to ourselves because of it. We need to understand this and stop being afraid of them. Any man can hate everything 
but no man can own everything. The fastest way to get rich is to hate being rich. This rule is true for more than just money. It also works for fame and relationships. Seneca is basically telling us to look down on fortune's part in these facets of life, which may seem like a strong word. Stoics don't base their happiness on things that can change at any time. Even though they may have tastes, they don't really care about things that are controlled by fortune. In this case, to hate something means to not care about it at all while truly disliking your real enemy, which is fortune. Now for some more useful advice. What should you be looking for instead if you've been after the wrong things? Do not try to get more than you need. Stop when you have enough. When you have a lot, you'll want even more. If you have what you need and don't want more, you are truly wealthy. It's an honor to be poor, he says, and if you're happy with your situation, it's not really poverty at all. That person is poor, not the one who doesn't have enough. Rich people want more. What does it matter how much money someone has saved up in a safe or warehouse, how many flocks they have, or how much money they make from income if they want their neighbor's property and only count their hopes for future gains? Do you want to know what the right amount of wealth is? It's first important to have what you need, and then what you have is enough. Be moderate with things you need every day, like food, drink, clothes, and a place to live. Even though these are basic wants, they should be met in a way that feels simple and enough. Going beyond what is needed can make you want more, which can set off a chain reaction of other bad habits. Having more than you need is not a good thing. A real good thing is having a mind that wants only what you need. Hold fast to this good and healthy rule of life. Only give in to your body as much as it needs for health. People should be stricter with their bodies so that they don't disobey their minds. You should only eat to satisfy your hunger, drink to quench your thirst, dress to keep out the cold, and live somewhere to avoid being uncomfortable. It doesn't really matter if the house is made of grass or different colored foreign marble. Know this, a man is just as safe under a thatch roof as under a gold roof. Hate everything that pointless work turns into a decoration or a beautiful thing and think about how the soul is the only thing that deserves to be awed. Though something may seem great to the mind, it may not be so to the soul. Things that are necessary for life have clear endings, but things that aren't necessary for life often don't. An endless search for money, fame, attention, strange things, long trips, fancy foods, or physical pleasures can trap someone in a loop of desire that they can't break. Giving in to this kind of constant want will fill your life with many bad habits, each one more demanding and bad than the last. We need to be aware of and accept the natural limits of our wants. We should not keep looking for things that aren't necessary because that will get in the way of our ability to relax. If you follow nature, you'll never be poor. If you follow what other people say, you'll never be rich. Nature doesn't need much, but people are always demanding their opinions. Imagine having the belongings of many millionaires. Imagine that your luck takes you far beyond the limits of your own income, covers you in gold and purple, and gives you so much luxury and wealth that you can bury the ground under your marble floors and walk on it. You could also have statues, paintings, and anything else that art has come up with to satisfy your need for luxury. Things like this will only teach you to want more. True wants have limits, but false desires that come from false beliefs can't end. The false has no limits. When you're on a road, you have to reach a certain point, but when you're lost, you can go wherever you want. So, remember your steps from doing nothing and if you want to know if what you're looking for is a natural desire or one that isn't, ask yourself if it can end in a clear place. If, after going a long way, you still see a farther away goal, you can be sure that this is not how things should be in nature. 
Check to see if things are really worth the price you pay for them. We often waste our money, time, energy and honesty on things we would quickly turn down if they forced us to pay for them. Be extra careful that none of your goals cost you your freedom, which is the most valuable thing you have. So, when we think about the things we want and work hard for, we should remember this truth. Either they don't have anything good about them, or the bad things are more common than the good. Some things are not needed and are not worth the money we spend on them. But this isn't clear to us, and we think things are free when they really cost us a lot. As proof of how stupid we are, we think that things we buy with cash are the only ones that are really bought, while things we spend our own money on are like free gifts. However, we would not buy these things if we had to give up our homes or a nice profitable land as payment. But we are eager to get them even if it means stress, danger, loss of respect, personal freedom and time. It is so true that each person thinks that nothing is less important than themselves. So, let's plan and act in every way the same way we always do when we go up to a huckster selling something. Let's find out how much we have to pay to get what we want. Things that don't cost us anything often hurt us the most. There are many things I can show you that have taken away our freedom through their search and purchase. If only these things did not belong to us, we would belong to ourselves. Remember that at your heart, you are a simple being with simple wants that can be met by simple means. It's silly to think that the whole world will work to meet your needs and provide a huge range of goods that not even 100 countries could make together. In old Rome, this was only said about wealthy people. Today, many people in the modern world have to deal with it. Now, Lucilius, is it not crazy that none of us really think about the fact that he is dying, weak, and only one person? Look at our kitchens and how busy the cooks are with all the fires. Do you think that all of this activity and food preparation is for one belly? Take a look at the old wine names and vintages from a lot of different years. Do you think it will be a single belly that will hold the wine that has been filled with the names of many consuls and grapes from many vineyards? Look around and make a note of how many areas have men plowing the ground and how many thousands of farmers are tilling and digging. What do you think? Are crops grown in Sicily and Africa for a single stomach? It would be smart and fair for each of us to take a look at ourselves, figure out what our bodies need and know how little and for how long each person can eat. Living in a time of unmatched comfort and ease may make self-denial seem like a blessing, but it actually offers a big challenge to our moral and personal growth. In these kinds of situations, the stoic practice of choosing to be uncomfortable becomes even more important. By choosing pain, turning down ease and abstaining from joys, we not only prepare ourselves for future challenges, but we also learn to value what we have more. The ancient Stoics did this in a number of ways, such as by sleeping on hard surfaces, not wearing clothes when it was cold or fasting. Like Seneca, many other people liked jumping into freezing aqueducts. We don't have aqueducts in the modern world, but we can still follow this philosophy in other ways. You could make a list of the things you think you can't live without and try not having them for a short time. Based on the thing, this could be anywhere from a day to a week or more. You want to show yourself that these comforts don't make you happy. This could mean giving up things like hot baths, air conditioning, coffee, meat, your phone, or even coffee. The challenge will work better to get rid of your fears if it is tailored to your comfort threshold. If we don't do anything about it, our wants will only get stronger. It's up to us to control them with reason and make them fit with nature. Going against your own will is hard, but there is a special pleasure in it. As your knowledge of what is truly good and bad grows, you will feel a deep sense of satisfaction when you reject what you once thought was important. Living by your philosophy of life makes you feel good, which shows that happiness can be a strong partner instead of a controlling force on the philosopher's mean.
Seneca writes about balance and how it can be used in everyday life in Letter 5 of Letters from a Stoic on the Thinker's Mean. He talks about how we should behave around other people as we grow in knowledge. This letter gives us ideas on how to balance the pursuit of intellectual goals with the realities of living in the real world. I admire how hard you work at school and how every day you try to become a better man, even when everything else is going on. Please don't just take my advice and keep going. I beg you to. But I warn you not to follow the lead of people who want to stand out instead of getting better by doing things that will get people talking. When it comes to how you dress or live in general, you should avoid wearing offensive clothes, having messy hair or a beard, showing disrespect for silverware, lying on the ground, or any other inappropriate ways of showing off your body. People look down on the very word philosophy, no matter how quietly it is practiced. What would happen if we started to break away from the ways of our fellow humans? On the inside, we should be completely different from each other, but on the outside, we should look like everyone else. Don't wear clothes that are too thin or too worn. You don't need a silver plate covered in solid gold, but we shouldn't think that the lack of silver and gold means you live a simple life either. In order to avoid scaring away and turning away the very people we are trying to help, let's try to keep a better standard of life than the majority, but not a lower standard. Our actions also make them not want to copy us in any way, because they are afraid that if they do, they will have to copy us in everything. The first thing that philosophy promises is understanding and community, or a sense of one's place among all people. We break our promise if we are different from other guys. We need to make sure that the ways we try to get people to admire us aren't silly or offensive. As you know, our motto is live according to nature, but it goes against nature to hurt your body, dislike simple beauty, be dirty on purpose, and eat food that is not only plain, but also gross and offensive. It's a sign of wealth to look for small things, and it's also crazy to avoid things that are normal and can be bought for a low price. Philosophy tells us to live in a simple way, not do punishment, and we can be simple and clean at the same time. This is the middle ground I agree with. Between the ways of a wise person and the ways of the world at large, our life should strike a happy balance. Men should all respect it, but they should also know what it means. We should be moderate in how we act so that we don't make ourselves look better or turn other people off from studying philosophy. That being said, this balance doesn't apply to our desire of virtue and mental health. According to Stoicism, the only way to have a truly happy life is through virtue, without even the slightest hint of greed, lust, anger, desire, or dependence on luck. Striking for this ideal prevents us from settling for less than we deserve or using small sins as prizes for our virtuous deeds, even though it may be beyond our grasp. Even if an animal is tamed and soft, it won't listen to reason because that's how nature made them. The same is true for emotions, no matter how weak they are. Tigers and lions never stop being wild. Sometimes they tame their wildness, but when you least expect it, their tamed wildness turns into craziness. Again, if reason wins, the passions won't even get going. But if they start going against the will of reason, they will keep going against the will of reason because it is easier to stop them first than to control them later. So, this middle ground is both confusing and pointless. It should only be seen as saying that we should be somewhat crazy or somewhat sick. Moderation is only found in virtue. It can't be found in sins that affect the mind. This is what stoic practice is, the state I feared. However, I am so determined to see how stable your mind is that I will also teach you something from the lessons of great men. Set aside a certain number of days to be happy with the simplest and cheapest food and the roughest clothing. During these days, ask yourself, is this the situation I feared? 
the soul should toughen itself up for times of greater stress when it is not under any care and it should do the same when fortune is being kind to protect itself from her violence. In days of peace, the soldier practices moves, puts up earthworks with no enemy in sight, and wearies himself by needless toil in order that he may be equal to unavoidable toil. If you would not have a man flinch when the problem comes, train him before it comes. Such is the course which those men have taken who, in their imitation of poverty, have every month come almost to want, that they might never shrink from what they had so often practiced. You need not think that I mean meals like Timon's or Popper's huts, or any other device which luxury millionaires use to beguile the boredom of their lives. Let the bed be a real one, and the scratchy blanket. Let the bread be hard and dirty. Endure all this for three or four days at a time, sometimes for more, so that it may be a test of yourself, instead of a mere interest. Then, I promise you, my dear Lucilius, you will leap for joy when filled with a pennyworth of food, and you will understand that a man's peace of mind does not rest upon fortune, for even when angry, she gives enough for our wants. This is a special self-denial practice that Seneca recommends to free us from the fear of poverty. Every month or every few months, commit three to four days to living with low financial means. During these days, prepare the most basic meals, consuming only what is necessary for sustenance. Avoid any form of paid entertainment or leisure activities. Adopt a simple dress code, minimize travel, and reduce your overall consumption of resources. The objective is to experience life as though fortune has cast you into poverty, helping you realize that there is nothing to dread in such a situation. This practice not only fosters gratitude for your usual lifestyle, but also diminishes the power material possessions have over you. Additionally, undertaking this exercise as a communal activity or with a group can enhance its impact and provide mutual support. Learn to hate your vices, and do you know why we have not the power to attain this stoic ideal? It is because we refuse to believe in our power. Nay, of a surety, there is something else which plays a part. It is because we are in love with our vices. We uphold them and prefer to make excuses for them rather than shake them off. We mortals have been endowed with sufficient strength by nature. If only we use this strength, if only we concentrate our powers and rouse them all to help us, or at least not to hinder us. The reason is unwillingness, the excuse inability. Making profound positive changes to our thoughts and actions is difficult, but certainly within our capabilities. The reason we do not immediately abandon our vices and run to virtue is that, despite what we may claim, we love our vices. It is a twisted kind of love, like being in an abusive relationship. We keep them around because we think we deserve the suffering or do not believe we could face the world without them. We must reclaim our freedom and courageously prove to ourselves that we can rise above them. There is nothing, Lucilius, to hinder you from entertaining good hopes about us just because we are even now in the grip of evil or because we have long been possessed thereby. There is no man to whom a good mind comes before an evil one. It is the evil mind that gets first hold on all of us. Learning virtue means unlearning vice. We should, therefore, continue to the task of freeing ourselves from flaws with all the more courage, because when once committed to us, the good is a permanent property. Virtue is not unlearned, but although virtues, when accepted, cannot leave and are easy to guard, yet the first steps in the approach to them are toilsome. It is characteristic of a weak and sick mind to fear that which is unknown. The mind must, therefore, be made to make a beginning. From then on, the medicine is not bitter, for just as soon as it is healing us, it begins to give pleasure. One enjoys other cures only after health is returned, but a draught of philosophy is at the same moment healthy and pleasant. We need an organized method to make this beginning and learn to hate our vices. 
The process looks something like the following and can be a writing or a thought exercise. 1. Try to be as thorough as you can in your examination. 2. Select one of your vices to focus on. 3. Describe why you like it. 4. Think about the real and imagined harm this vice has caused you. 5. Think about the bad things you do to keep this vice going. 6. Think about the chances and progress that it has kept you from getting. 7. Think about how much better your life would be if you had this virtue instead of this vice. For example, think about a strong addiction to drink. It might make you feel better temporarily or boost your social confidence, but it will hurt your health and take away your freedom. It can become a crutch that makes it harder to deal with life's difficulties reducing resilience. This habit not only wastes your money and time, but it could also make you dishonest with people you care about. Instead, think about getting your strength from within and the freedom that comes with it. If people lived by virtue, their lives would be much better. Often, we only recognize our flaws on a surface level, not fully understanding where they come from or how they affect us. Deep thought is an important part of changing how you act. This process keeps our vices and the things that make us act on them in the forefront of our thoughts. This makes us more aware of them and better able to fight them in the present. By doing this practice over and over, we can slowly change our character to be more wise. Remember that our focus on certain things is short-lived, only a few days so it's important to keep focusing on the same bad habits. Things we'd rather not think about get forgotten. Keep doing this until exercising virtue becomes your normal reaction and way of life, taking the place of your bad habits. Part 5 is about having courage. Stoic courage means being able to deal with bad luck in a smart way. It means being able to use philosophy when things are tough. Knowing that giving up virtue and tranquility is worse than any punishment you could receive for doing the right thing and speaking the truth. For most of us, it will mean using the philosophy on our deathbeds and in our last hour. Letters from a Stoic 85 has Seneca's answer to the question of courage. I think it says a lot about Stoicism that it worked in a time when slavery and torture were the things that kept people up at night. It's what you Stoics believe. So they answer that a brave man will put himself in harm's way. By no means he won't be afraid of them, but he will stay away from them. He should be careful, but he shouldn't be scared. So what does he not have to fear? Death, jail time, fire, and all the other weapons of fortune. Not at all, because he knows they aren't bad, they just look like they are. He thinks that all of these things are the worst things about being human. Him, a picture of slavery, beatings, chains, hunger, being mutilated by disease or torture, or anything else you can think of. Those kinds of things will be seen by him as terrifying signs of a crazy mind. The only people who should be afraid of bugbears and boogeymen are scared people. We let ourselves be scared like kids are scared of the monsters under their beds if we live in fear of the pain and suffering that come with life. Everything that is going to happen to us has already happened to a huge number of other people, including many right now. Some results may not be what we want, but they are beyond our control and are not worth sacrificing our tranquility over. In fact, these hard times can be seen as valuable chances to show virtue. Being faithful and following philosophy when things are going badly is a true sign of devotion and character strength. After this, Seneca asks, then what is an evil? Giving into what are called evils is what it means. It means giving up your freedom and letting them control you when we should really be willing to go through anything to keep our freedom. We can't keep our freedom if we don't hate the things that hold us back. It would be clear to men what a brave man should do if they knew what bravery was. 
because courage isn't moving without thinking, being careless, loving danger, or things that make you scared. When we know something, we can tell the difference between something bad and something good. When it comes to taking care of itself, bravery is the best. It also has the most patience for things that look like they are bad. So, you ask, what should a brave man be afraid of? Has your brave man no fear if the sword is held over his neck, if he is constantly pierced here and there, if he sees his own intestines in his lap, if he is tortured again after being held captive so that he can feel the pain more deeply, and if blood starts flowing again from his intestines where it stopped flowing not long ago? Should you also say that he hasn't felt any pain? Yes, he has felt pain, because no virtue can be without feelings, but he is not afraid. He is still strong and looks down from a high place at his pain. Do you want to know what spirit drives him in this situation? The spirit of someone is giving comfort to a sick friend. Things that most people think of as evil, greed, violence, lying, poverty, sickness and pain, are actually normal parts of life and can't be evil. The real evil is telling ourselves that these states are bad, which makes our own pain worse. We have the strength to deal with these problems that come our way, and when we do, we not only show moral beauty, but we also lessen our own pain. Calling something that is just not desired bad and identifying with our pain only makes it worse. Whether we rise to great heights or fall to chaos depends on how we react to our situations, not the situations themselves. People who are strong know that moral problems always have a cost, whether you act or don't act. The normal person might only see the risks of courage, like getting hurt, losing money, or having their image hurt, but a stoic knows that the bigger risk is choosing evil over virtue, or not doing the good they can. This mistake blocks the way to a sound mind, which is the only real good thing. This means that facing danger is not bad. What is bad is avoiding the duty to face that danger head on. Real freedom means not having to worry about money. It means not having to worry about dying or being poor. It means being sure that you can handle anything that life throws at you. This goal must be worked hard for and with courage in order to be reached. What if we did what Hannibal did and stopped the flow of events? What if we gave up the war and let our bodies be praised? Everyone would be right to blame us for being too lazy at the wrong time, which is dangerous even for the winner, let alone someone who is just about to win. And those who fly the Carthaginian flag have even less right to do this than we do, because we are in more danger than they are. You can't beat them if we slow down and put in more work than they do. Fortune is against me, and I'm not going to do what she says. I refuse to give in to the yoke. Instead, I shake off the load that is around me, which takes even more courage. The soul shouldn't be spoiled. Giving in to happiness means giving up pain, work, and poverty as well. Wanting to have the same power over me as pleasure will make me angry and ambitious at the same time. All of these strong emotions will tear me apart. Freedom is what I want, and I'm working hard to get it. You may ask, what is freedom? Not being a slave to any situation, rule or chance is what it means. It means making fortune join the groups on the same terms as everyone else. Her power will be broken on the day I know I have the upper hand. Should I listen to her when I have control over death? True freedom comes from always being calm about life's good and bad things. The unwavering belief that your path will not change, no matter what happens in life, and the willingness to accept obstacles as proof of your strength. Being free means knowing that things will be okay no matter what. Someone who has this kind of freedom doesn't depend on their job, family, health, or country to make them happy. Such factors are out of their control and they know that they are not what makes them happy, even though they may want these gifts. These people's happiness comes from the only thing they can control, what they think 
and feel. This is what real freedom means. Being free not from your situations, but from the control that outside things have over your inner peace. Stoic practice, carrying the lentils. Stoicism's founder, Zeno of Citium, lost his fortune and nearly his life in a shipwreck before washing up in Athens at age 22, enamored with philosophy. The first of his teachers was Crates of Thebes, a cynic philosopher and student of Diogenes, who set about teaching the young Zeno the necessity of being immune to public opinion. He assigned Zeno the task of carrying around with him a pot of lentils, considered a sign of poverty at the time. This is the ancient equivalent of broadcasting to everyone you come across that you are surviving off ramen noodles. When Crates saw Zeno hiding his lentils under his cloak, he smashed the pot with his staff, sending the then lentil-soaked Zeno fleeing with embarrassment. It was a waste of food, but Zeno learned the lesson. You cannot be a Stoic and care what people think about you. If you care about people seeing you carry lentils, if you cannot tolerate even insignificant judgment like this from others, how will you stand up for what is right when it is hard and everyone else is going the other way? How will you ever be equal with fortune if you cannot even best public opinion? For this practice, identify your personal lentils. You should be able to do things that make you nervous or embarrassed, like dancing, singing, or expressing affection in public, acting in a play, or trying stand-up comedy. Do these things on purpose, letting yourself get used to the fear of being judged. This exercise is meant to boost your courage in low-stakes situations, getting you ready to stick to your values and principles when faced with tough situations. Stoic practice, negative visualization. Thinking carefully about potential misfortunes is a good way to train your courage today so it is ready at hand when you need it in the future. Today, it is you who threaten me with these terrors, but I have always threatened myself with them and have prepared myself as a man to meet man's destiny. If an evil has been pondered beforehand, the blow is gentle when it comes. To the fool, however, and to him who trusts in fortune, each event as it arrives comes in a new and sudden form, and a large part of evil to the inexperienced consists in its novelty. This is proved by the fact that men endure with greater courage when they have once become accustomed to them the things which they had at first regarded as hardships. Hence the wise man accustoms himself to coming trouble, lightening by long reflection, the evils which others lighten by long endurance. We sometimes hear the inexperienced say, I knew that this was in store for me, but the wise man knows that all things are in store for him. Whatever happens, he says, I knew it. This is likely the most challenging practice, so be prepared to encounter some resistance. Begin with less severe and improbable misfortunes gradually progressing to more daunting scenarios that are likely to occur. The aim is to contemplate these situations thoughtfully rather than worry about them, developing the ability to think about the events without having an immediate emotional reaction is a key part of this practice and will require patience. Our ultimate objective is to achieve a state of complete preparedness, enabling us to mentally navigate through the gravest of life's potential hardships. This includes confronting the possibility of our own premature death, the loss of loved ones, severe illnesses, accidents resulting in disabilities, victimization through violence, financial collapse, wrongful accusations, and imprisonment. Fortune is a true monster, and if we want to stand firm against it, we must prepare for it to assail our every weak point. We should therefore reflect upon all contingencies and should fortify our minds against the evils which may possibly come. Exile, the torture of disease, wars, shipwreck, we must think on these. Chance may tear you from your country or your country from you, or may banish you to the desert. This very place where throngs are stifling may become a desert. 
let us place before our eyes, in its entirety, the nature of man's lot. And if we would not be overwhelmed or even dazed by those unwanted evils, as if they were novel, let us summon to our minds beforehand, not as great an evil as oftentimes happens, but the very greatest evil that possibly can happen. We must reflect upon fortune fully and completely. While most of us will not be able to go that far in our preparation, it is crucial that this practice not be skipped altogether, even by those who find it especially challenging. If someone wants to get their mind healthy, they need to do at least some negative visualization of the bad things that are going to happen to them and any personal monsters that scare them. This is because the path to a calm mind is blocked while these things are still in control of us. Negative visualization can be done through journaling or meditation, but because the mind naturally doesn't like to think about bad things, it's best to do it alone. Figure out what you're afraid of. To start, figure out what fears or situations make you anxious or upset. What are these fears and why do they have so much power over you? Imagine what will happen. Really feel what the scary event or situation is like as it happens. Think about the short-term and long-term effects which will happen. Embrace your inherent ability to respond with virtue and integrity, aligning your actions with your philosophy of control. Part 6. The Right Way to Give Among the numerous faults of those who pass their lives recklessly and without due reflection, my good friend Liberales, I should say that there is hardly anyone so hurtful to society as this, that we neither know how to bestow or how to receive a benefit. The Stoics believe that we are born for each other, which leads to the conclusion that it is not just good to benefit one another, but it is how we build the primary bonds of society. We must have generous intentions followed up by generous acts and bestow them on worthy people so that we encourage the return of those benefits and the building of a chain of connection and love between the receiver and ourselves. We must learn to give at the right time and in the right way and then to act as if we forgot our debt. We must also learn to receive and repay in the right way how to show gratitude, and how to keep our benefits in the forefront of our minds. We are to speak of benefits and to define a matter which is the chief bond of human society. We are to lay down a rule of life such that neither careless open-handedness may commend itself to us under the guise of goodness of heart, and yet that our circumspection, while it moderates, may not quench our generosity a quality in which we ought neither to exceed nor to fall short. Men must be taught to be willing to give, willing to receive, willing to return, and to place before themselves the high aim not merely of equaling, but even of surpassing those to whom they are indebted, both in good offices and in good feeling. Because the man whose duty it is to repay can never do so unless he outdoes his benefactor. The one class must be taught to look for no return, the other to feel deeper gratitude. So, what is a benefit? A benefit is the art of being kind in a way that both gives and receives pleasure, and it happens naturally and without thought. What is important is not the thing that is done or given, but the spirit in which it is done or given, because a benefit doesn't exist in the thing that is done or given, but in the mind of the person who does or gives it. You can see how big the difference is. One man says that he owes the money which he has received, another that he owes a consulship, a priesthood, a province, and so on. These, however, are but the outward signs of kindnesses, not the kindnesses themselves. A benefit is not to be felt and handled. It is a thing which exists only in the mind. There is a great difference between the subject matter of a benefit and the benefit itself. Wherefore, neither gold nor silver nor any of those things which are most highly esteemed are benefits, but the benefit lies in the goodwill of him who gives them. The ignorant take notice only of that which comes before their eyes and which can be owned and passed from hand to hand, 
while they disregard that which gives these things their value. The things which we hold in our hands, which we see with our eyes, and which avarice hugs, are transitory. They may be taken from us by ill luck or by violence, but a kindness lasts even after the loss of that by means of which it was bestowed, for it is a good deed which no violence can undo. For instance, suppose that I ransomed a friend from pirates, but another pirate has caught him and thrown him into prison. The pirate has not robbed him of my benefit, but has only robbed him of the enjoyment of it. Why we give benefits? We bestow benefits on others because it is our duty and to maintain a clear conscience, ensuring that we have left no good we could do undone. Our motivation must be purely altruistic. If we seek to profit ourselves, it is not a benefit. Understanding this concept is important because a significant part of a wise person's tranquility comes from the time they spend each day thinking about benefits, bestowing them and being grateful for them. It is so far from being right to bestow a benefit for one's own advantage that often, as I have explained, it is one's duty to bestow it when it involves one's own loss and risk. For instance, if I assist a man when beset by robbers so that he gets away from them safely or help some victim of power and bring upon myself the party spite of a body of influential men, very probably incurring myself the same disgrace from which I saved him, although I might have taken the other side and looked on with safety at struggles with which I have nothing to do. If I were to give bail for one who has been condemned and when my friend's goods were advertised for sale, I were to give a bond to the effect that I would make restitution to the creditors, if in order to save a prescribed person, I myself run the risk of being prescribed. No one, when about to buy a villa at Tusculum or Tibur for a summer retreat because of the health of the locality, considers how many years purchase he gives for it. This must be looked to by the man who makes a profit by it. The same is true with benefits. When you ask what return I get for them, I answer the consciousness of a good action. What return does one get for benefits? Pray tell me, what return one gets for righteousness, innocence, magnanimity, chastity, temperance. We Stoics, on the other hand, take pleasure in bestowing benefits, even though they cost us labor, provided that they lighten the labors of others, though they lead us into danger, provided that they save others, though they straighten our means if they alleviate the poverty and distresses of others. What difference does it make to me whether I receive benefits or not? Even if I receive them, it is still my duty to bestow them. A benefit has in view the advantage of him upon whom we bestow it, not our own. Otherwise, we merely bestow it upon ourselves. Gratitude is a virtue. Ingratitude is a vice. We are soft, weak creatures. We may be clever, but on our own, we are not a match for most animals, nature, and each other. It is only through union with each other that we are able to provide security and prosperity, and nothing builds union like gratitude or breaks it down more than ingratitude. A proof that gratitude is desirable for itself lies in the fact that ingratitude is to be avoided for itself, because no vice more powerfully rends a sewer and destroys the union of the human race. To what do we trust for safety if not in mutual good offices one to another? It is by the interchange of benefits alone that we gain some measure of protection for our lives and of safety against sudden disasters. Taken singly, what should we be? A prey and quarry for wild beasts, a luscious and easy banquet, for while all other animals have sufficient strength to protect themselves and those which are born to a wandering solitary life are armed, man is covered by a soft skin has no powerful teeth or claws with which to terrify other creatures, but weak and naked by himself, is made strong by union. Ingratitude is the seed of much of the other wickedness people get themselves wrapped up in. We should be on high alert against it, because if we can keep it from taking root, 
we can save ourselves the greater struggle of uprooting some full-grown tree later on. It is also unreasonable because what you lose when someone does not return your benefit is the lesser part of it. The greater part is the virtuous action you took to help them. That should be more than enough for you, and if you happen to get the material of the benefit back, it is a bonus. There is nothing to be ungrateful about. There will always be murderers, tyrants, thieves, adulterers, ravishers, sacrilegious, and traitors. But the worst of all of these is the ungrateful man, as we can see from Stoic philosophy. People who are ungrateful all have the same flaw, though it shows up in a lot of different ways. A person is ungrateful if he or she denies receiving a benefit, acts like they didn't receive it, or doesn't return it. Forgetting about it is the worst kind of ungratefulness. Other people feel their debt and have some worth, even if they can't repay it because of their bad character. The right way to give. Bestowing benefits seems simple, but is rarely done properly, often dragging ourselves and the people we want to help through unnecessary hardship. We rarely give what we should and often ruin our gifts with the way we give them or deal with them after they have been given. It is a cause for pity for the whole human race that being helpful is so difficult. Lucky for us, Seneca has a lot of advice for us on this topic. First off, how should we choose people to bestow benefits on? We should prefer people who are likely to be grateful for them over people who are likely to pay them back. We should value people by their hearts alone. In choosing a fit person, I shall not, as you expect, pay the least attention to whether I am likely to get any return from him. For I choose one who will be grateful, not one who will return my goodness. And it often happens that the man who makes no return is grateful, while he who returns a benefit is ungrateful for it. I value men by their hearts alone, and therefore I shall pass over a rich man if he be unworthy and give to a good man, though he be poor, for he will be grateful, however destitute he may be. Since whatever he may lose, his heart will still be left to him. There are three things we should give first. What is necessary, what is useful, and what is nice. The next thing we need to decide is what kinds of benefits we want to give and how we should do them. Let's start with what is necessary. Next, what is useful. Finally, what is nice, as long as it lasts. We need to start with what is important, because things that keep life going have a very different effect on the mind than things that make it look better or feel better. Think about what the person you're giving the gift to, not what you want to give them. Don't give useless or offensive gifts. When we give these kinds of gifts, we need to be careful that they are acceptable by giving them at the right time or by giving things that aren't common but that few people have, or at least that few people have these days. Or we can give things in a way that, even though they aren't naturally valuable, it's important to think about what gift will bring the person the most happiness and what he will notice most often, so that whenever he is with it, he is also with us. We should never send gifts that aren't useful, like shooting gear to a woman or an old man, books to a countryman, or nets to catch wild animals to a quiet literary man. But when we want to send something that will make our friends happy, we should be careful not to send something that will insult them by reminding them of their flaws. For example, if we send wine to someone who drinks a lot, or drugs to someone who is sick, that gift becomes offensive because it makes fun of the person receiving it. We should think about what our friends might need and offer it to them without being asked. It is very kind to save our friends the shame of having to ask for help, which we would gladly give them if they did. The best thing to do is to guess what someone wants, and the next best thing is to give it to them. Being ahead of the game with our friends by giving them what they want before they ask for it makes the gift much more valuable. Don't make an honest man ask for it with confusion and blushing. 
We should agree right away when our friends ask for help, so that even though we didn't know what they needed, we show that we meant to. If we can't guess what our friends will need, we should at least cut them off when they ask us for something, so that it looks like we were reminded of what we meant to do, instead of being asked to do it. We should agree right away, and, by being quick, make it look like we meant to do it even before they asked. According to ethical philosophy, some benefits should be given in secret, while others should be given in public. Giving without being known is okay if it helps the person receiving the gift more. Sometimes the person being helped needs to be tricked so that he can receive our gift without knowing where it came from. Give a lot and then try to forget what you gave. This keeps you from ruining your gifts by acting like a debt and gets you ready for the happiness of getting something back. The best man is one who gives freely, never expects anything in return, and is happy when something is returned because he forgets what he gave and sees it as a gift. The best way to remind someone to be thankful is to give them something new to be thankful for. Only the person who received the benefit should talk about it. We shouldn't talk about the benefits we've given men. The best way to remind them of them is to ask them to return them. We shouldn't bring them up or remember them. You should only remind a man of what you've given him by giving him something else. If we want our benefits to be returned, we should not even tell others about them. The person who receives them should be the one to tell others. If we want our benefits to be returned, we should really want the person we are giving them to thrive. We should love them and give them more benefits so that they reach their full potential and become the kind of person who returns our benefits, making us both happy and safe. Stopping work after planting the seed means the farmer will lose what he has worked for. It takes a lot of work to turn seeds into a crop. No plant will bear fruit unless it is cared for with equal care from the beginning to the end. The same is true for benefits. What benefits are better than the ones children get from their parents? But these benefits are useless if they are left behind when they are young, if the loving care of the parents doesn't watch over the gift they have given for a long time. The same is true for other benefits. If you don't help the person you have given something to, they will lose it. Giving isn't enough. You have to grow what you have given if you want them to be grateful to you. You should not only help them, but also love them. Don't give them things that will hurt them or lead them astray, even if they ask for them. It is your job to think about what might happen if they get what you're giving them and make sure it doesn't. If you love your friends, you should let them suffer bad things happen to themselves, even if they beg, get angry, or curse you. If you do not love them, you should refuse their request and take the consequences. We should think about the benefits that will last, as well as the benefits that will come now. We shouldn't just give men what they want, but what they will be glad they got in the future. Many people say, I know this won't help him, but what can I do? He cries out for it. I just can't say no to his pleas. He will blame himself, not me, if you let him do it. Not at all. He will blame someone unjustly when he comes to his senses after the excitement is over. How can he not hate the person who helped him hurt and put himself in danger? It is cruel kindness to let yourself be persuaded into giving something that hurts those who beg for it, and it is the highest virtue to protect someone from harm against their will. Giving people what they want is just hate disguised as politeness. Let's give perks that get better the more they are used and can never turn into harm. I will never give a man money if I know he will use it to cheat on his wife. I won't be found with any bad plans or actions either. I will try to keep guys from crying if I can. At the very least, I will never help them with it if not. My friend will never get the tools he needs to do harm from anyone else but himself. This is true, whether anger drives him to do wrong or desire tempts him away from the safe road. I also won't let him say one day that he destroyed me because he loved me. 
We've looked at Seneca's ideas about what benefits are and how to give them. Seneca teaches us that the real value of a benefit is not in the gift itself, but in the spirit with which it is given. This important distinction shifts our attention from the tangible aspects of giving to the intangible qualities of kindness and goodwill. Seneca says that the timing, the way, and the specific needs of the recipient all play a big role in how important a benefit is. According to him, we should be proactive in understanding and anticipating the needs of others, give without expecting anything in return, and choose recipients based on their character rather than their ability to repay. This encourages a culture of generosity and gratitude. By practicing this art, we not only improve the lives of others, but also foster our own moral development and inner tranquility, according to Seneca's lessons. As we've already talked about why and how to give benefits, the next step is to look at the equally important skills of receiving and returning them. This is a very important part because it completes the cycle of generosity and strengthens the bonds of union that give us safety and peace of mind. When we receive a benefit from a good person, we should be grateful, which repays their kindness toward us. If we also received something material, we should return it if we can, but the main part of our debt is paid by remembering the benefit and our plan to repay it. As Seneca says, that benefit which consists of the action is repaid when we receive it graciously. That other which consists of something kindness has been returned, which paid off the debt of kindness. Now, the actual debt needs to be paid back. Thus, although we may declare that he who has received a benefit with goodwill has returned the favor, yet we counsel him to return to the giver something of the same kind as that which he has received. Some part of what we have said departs from the conventional line of thought and then rejoins it by another part. We declare that a wise man cannot receive an injury, yet if a man hits him with his fist, that man will be found guilty of doing him an injury. We declare that a fool can possess nothing, yet if a man stole anything from a fool, we should find that man guilty of theft. We declare that all men are mad, yet we do not dose all men with whore, but we put into the hands of these very persons whom we call madmen, both the right of voting and of pronouncing judgment. Similarly, we say that a man who has received a benefit with goodwill has returned the favor, yet we leave him in debt nevertheless, bound to repay it, even though he has repaid it. This is not to disown benefits, but is an encouragement to us, neither to fear to receive benefits, nor to faint under the too great burden of them. Good things have been given to me. I have been kept from going hungry. I have been saved from the pain of being very poor. My freedom, which is more important than life itself, has been protected. How will I be able to thank you for your help? When will the time come that I can show him how grateful I am? The day has already come when a man talks like this. If someone gives you something nice, accept it and be grateful for it. Don't be happy that you got something. Be happy that you have to repay them. That way, you'll never be guilty of the great sin of becoming ungrateful because of bad luck. Giving and receiving are both good, but repaying someone is harder. We should be happy about it and treasure the good things they did for us. Returning them at the right time shows that we are eager to get out of our friendly obligation. There are people who think it shows they have a great mind if they offer to give and fill many men's pockets and homes with their presence. These people are very wrong because sometimes these things happen because someone is very lucky. They don't realize how much better and harder it is to receive gifts than to give them. I must not praise either act. An honest heart should both give and receive because both are valuable. When done virtuously, indeed, to owe is more difficult because it takes more effort to keep something safe than to give it away. As a result, we shouldn't be in a rush to repay 
and we shouldn't try to do so before the time is right either. My benefactor gave me his gift, so I shouldn't worry about him or myself. He has enough security. He can't lose it unless he loses me, and even then, he won't lose it, because I thanked him for it and asked for it back. Someone who thinks too much about repaying a favor should assume that their friend thinks too much about receiving it. Don't worry about either way. If he wants to get his benefit back, he can. Seneca gives one last piece of advice on how to receive. When it comes to getting things from bad men, if the person is truly evil, then no gift could be useful and no debt could be due. But if the source is just a bad person, any help you get from them should be returned, not given. When it comes to the average bad guy I can find in any town's market, and who only people fear, I would give him back something I had gotten from him. It's not fair for me to benefit from his bad behavior. It doesn't matter if the owner is good or bad. Let me give back what is not mine. But I would think about it very carefully if I weren't returning it, but giving it to someone else. Thank God. Let's talk about the gifts that nature gives us now that we've talked about how to get benefits from other people. Is not just living in a world that seems to have been designed to meet our needs, one with the sun's warmth, the star's direction, and a lot of food, beauty, and art, a great benefit in and of itself. In fact, it is a wonderful gift that makes us think about how generous life is and how we fit into it. You would say that you got something good if someone gave you a few acres. Could you say that the fact that the earth has no limits is not a benefit? You would call it an advantage if someone gave you money and filled your chest. God has dug a huge number of mines and let a huge number of rivers flow from the ground. He has hidden huge amounts of silver, copper and iron everywhere, like rolling sands of gold. He has also given you the tools to find them by putting clues on the Earth's surface that show where the spoils are hidden. Still, do you say that you haven't gotten anything out of it? If someone gave you a house that was bright with marble and had a roof that was covered with colors and gold, you would think that was a big benefit. God built a huge house for you that doesn't fear fire or destruction. It doesn't have any thin panels that are thinner than the saw that was used to cut them. Instead, it has huge blocks of the most valuable stone, all made of the different materials that you admire so much. He built a roof that shines in different ways at night and during the day. Still, do you say that you haven't gotten anything out of it? When Seneca talks about the idea of God, he uses such a broad meaning that it could even make sense to a current atheist. He says that if we think of God as being the same as Natura, or as the first cause in a line of causes, then God is basically the limit of what we can understand. Today, we might compare God to the moment just before the Big Bang, which was a strange, unexplainable event that led to our existence in this beautiful world. To use an example, imagine that you were in an accident and someone saved your life. You would probably feel very thankful even if you didn't know who saved your life. Along the same lines, we should be very thankful just for existing, which is a bigger gift than being saved from danger. A smart person would treat the gift of life like any other nameless gift, with deep gratitude and a desire to keep the gift itself. This way of thinking helps us feel linked to and thankful for the bigger forces at work in the world, even if we can't fully understand or name them. My enemy says that all of this comes from nature. Do you not know that when you say this, you are just talking about God with a different name? Since God and holy reason are at the heart of nature and everything in it, what else is nature? It doesn't matter what term you use to talk to the author of our world. You can call him Jupiter the best, the greatest, the thunderer, or the stayer. This is not because, as history say, he stopped the Roman army from running away when Romulus prayed for help, but because all things stay the same because he is good. You wouldn't be lying if you called this guy fate, 
because fate is just a line of causes that are all linked together. He is the first cause that all the others rely on. You'll also be right to call him any name you want that sounds like it has magical strength and power. His traits may be as many as his titles. How to deal with people who aren't grateful? If the world were full of stoic sages, we wouldn't have to tell anyone to return a favor. We could just sit back and wait for them all to be returned at the right time. Due to the fact that we do not live in a world with any stoic teachers, we will sometimes need to tell our friends of the good things we have done for them so that they do not become selfish because they did not know or pay attention. To wake up some guys, you only need to stir them up, not hit them. In the same way, for some guys, the sense of respect that comes from returning a favor is not dead, but asleep. Let's wake it up. They will say, don't turn the kindness you showed me into a wrong. It's only a wrong if you don't expect something in return, which makes me ungrateful. What if I don't know what kind of payment you want? If I've been so busy with work and other things that I haven't been able to keep an eye out for a chance to help you, please let me know what you want me to do. Why do you feel hopeless before putting me to the test? Why are you in such a hurry that you'll lose both your friend and the benefit you were hoping to get? How are you going to know if I don't want to return you or don't know how to? Is it a purpose or a chance that I want? Put me to the test. That's why I would remind him of what I had done, but not with anger, not in public, and not in a way that would make him feel bad, but so that he would think he remembered it himself instead of being reminded of it. If we can't make our friend feel good about themselves, we have to be kind and accept it. Because our friends are outside of us and out of our control, letting their stupid actions upset our tranquility of mind only makes us both look like fools. Our enemy says, but what if we don't gain anything from this? What if he acts like he forgot about it? What should I do? You now ask a very necessary question and one which fitly concludes this branch of the subject. How, namely, one ought to bear with the ungrateful. I answer calmly, gently, magnanimously. Never let anyone's discourtesy, forgetfulness or ingratitude enrage you so much that you do not feel any pleasure at having bestowed a benefit upon him. Never let your wrongs drive you into saying, I wish I had not done it. While it is a serious vice, disturbing our tranquility over ingratitude is as unreasonable as being upset at people for all their other universal failings. It is the nature of the human condition that we are born bad and then struggle to become good. Instead of prosecuting the ingratitude of another, we ought to plead for universal amnesty, for we ourselves are only better than the worst by a few degrees. If you are indignant at men being ungrateful, you ought also to be indignant at their being luxurious, avaricious, and lustful. You might as well be indignant with sick men for being ugly or with old men for being pale. It is indeed a serious vice. It is not to be borne, and it sets men at variance with one another. Nay, it rends and destroys that union by which alone our human weakness can be supported. Yet it is so absolutely universal that even those who complain of it, most are not themselves free from it. If you carefully examine yourself, perhaps you will find the vice of which you complain in your own bosom. You are wrong in being angry with a universal failing, and foolish also, for it is your own as well. You must pardon others that you may yourself be acquitted. You will make your friend a better man by bearing with him. You will in all cases make him a worse one by reproaching him. Why exaggerations are useful? Near the end of On Benefits, Seneca says a few words about why the exaggerations he has used throughout the text are useful. It is important that we don't take the maxims seriously and let them lead us wrong and that we understand why they are useful. People who you tell to do something should be told to do more than enough so that they will do what is enough. The point of all lies is to get to the truth. So the person who said horses were whiter than snow and faster than the wind. 
said things that couldn't possibly be true so that people would think they were as true as possible. Let the man who has given a benefit forget it means that he shouldn't remember it, but it shouldn't look like he does. When we say that repayment of a benefit shouldn't be demanded, we don't mean that it shouldn't be demanded at all. Repayment is often demanded from bad men, and even good men need to be reminded of it. Am I not to show someone a way to repay that which they don't see? Am I not to explain? The ball game. Now that we've talked about how a Stoic should give and receive, how do we remember all of these rules and put them into practice in real life? To help us, I'll use Corpus's comparison of the game of ball, in which the ball will always fall because of either the thrower or the catcher's fault. It can only stay in the air when it goes between the hands of two people who each throw and catch it correctly. If we have to do with a practiced and skilled player, we shall throw the ball more recklessly, for however it may come, that quick and agile hand will send it back again. If we are playing with an unskilled novice, we shall not throw it so hard but far more gently, guiding it straight into his very hands, and we shall run to meet it when it returns to us. This is just what we ought to do in conferring benefits. Let us teach some men how to do so, and be satisfied if they attempt it, if they have the courage and the will to do so. The game Sippus was referring to may have been Ipisk Kuros, an ancient Greek game for which no detailed rules have survived, but seems like a mix of rugby and keep away. While that sounds fun, I think Ultimate Frisbee is the best modern game for the simile. If you have ever thrown a frisbee, you know that it does not come naturally. It takes some practice to get it to somewhere else without bouncing it off the grass or arcing it way off in the wrong direction. Catching the frisbee takes some practice as well. You often need to make a quick judgment about where it is going and move fast to intercept it. Sometimes someone else, other than the intended recipient, makes the catch, either through superior skill or just being in the right place at the right time. Sometimes the wind gusts mid-throw and the frisbee winds up on the other side of the neighbor's fence. The benefit is the frisbee and we want to throw it the best way we can for our friend to catch it and then move deftly to catch it no matter what quality throw they return it with. We want the game to be fun so people will continue to play it with us back and forth with more people and more skill for our whole lives. As a real-life stoic practice, play the ball game. This goes along with the journaling we are already doing. Always be on the lookout for good things you can do for other people. Asking yourself, what can I do for people, makes you feel good and makes you act better than you would otherwise. Think about the receiver's skill level and make sure the ball is caught. Have fun and remember the good things that have happened to you. Part 8 on the shortness of life. I need a stout heart to hear without flinching this din of battle, which sounds roundabout, and all would rightly think me mad if when grey beards and women were heaping up rocks for the fortifications, when the armour-clad youths inside the gates were awaiting or even demanding the order for a sally, when the spears of the foemen were quivering in our gates and the very ground was rocking with mines and subterranean passages. I say they would rightly think me mad if I were to sit idle, putting such petty poses as this. What you have not lost, you have, but you have not lost any horns. Therefore, you have horns or other tricks constructed after the model of this piece of sheer silliness. And yet I may well seem in your eyes no less mad if I spend my energies on that sort of thing, for even now I am in a state of siege, and yet in the former case, it would be merely a peril from the outside that threatened me and a wall that sundered me from the foe. As it is now, death-dealing perils are in my very presence. I have no time for such nonsense. A mighty undertaking is on my hands. What am I to do? Death is on my trail and life is fleeting away. Teach me something with which to face these troubles. Bring it to pass that I shall cease trying to escape from death and that life may cease to escape from me. Give me courage to meet hardships. 
make me calm in the face of the unavoidable, relax the straightened limits of the time which has allotted me, show me that the good in life does not depend upon life's length but upon the use we make of it, also that it is possible, or rather usual, for a man who has lived long to have lived too little. Say to me when I lie down to sleep, you may not wake again, and when I have woken, you may not go to sleep again. Say to me when I go forth from my house, you may not return, and when I return, you may never go forth again. You are mistaken if you think that only on an ocean voyage there is a very slight space between life and death. No, the distance between is just as narrow everywhere. It is not everywhere that death shows himself so near at hand, yet everywhere he is as near at hand. Many people have been told they will die and have seen others die, but they still act as if they are sure they will be the first to live forever. This is one of our common crazy beliefs. We do this because we are afraid of death, even though it is an outside event as natural as birth. We didn't fear birth because we were nothing before we were born. We s. We make our lives long or short by how we use our time. A life of limited years spent wisely, possessing tranquility of mind, living in accordance with nature, is infinitely preferable to a long one wasted by a fool. We must realize this and start out for the good life with all haste. We must set out at this very moment. We have already wasted much of the day and have a long and arduous journey to make before nightfall. It is not that we have a short space of time, but that we waste much of it. Life is long enough and it has been given in sufficiently generous measure to allow the accomplishment of the very greatest things if the whole of it is well invested. But when it is squandered in luxury and carelessness, when it is devoted to no good end, forced at last by the ultimate necessity, we perceive that it has passed away before we were aware that it was passing. So it is. The life we receive is not short, but we make it so, nor do we have any lack of it, but are wasteful of it. Just as great and princely wealth is scattered in a moment when it comes into the hands of a bad owner, while wealth, however limited, if it is entrusted to a good guardian, increases by use. So our life is amply long for him who orders it properly. We waste ourselves in so many ways and prioritize the wasting, sacrificing everything else for it. We are possessed by greed, lust, ambition, or nihilism. We chase after our own achievement or spend ourselves supporting the achievement of others. We are made anxious by both success and failure. We do all of this without doing the most important things first. We must learn the fundamentals of life. Why do we complain of nature? She has shown herself kindly. Life, if you know how to use it, is long. But one man is possessed by an avarice that is insatiable, another by a toilsome devotion to tasks that are useless. One man is bloated with wine, another is paralyzed by sloth. One man is exhausted by an ambition that always hangs upon the decision of others. Another, driven on by the greed of the trader, is led over all lands and all seas by the hope of gain. Some are tormented by a passion for war and are always either bent upon inflicting danger upon others or concerned about their own. Some there are who are worn out by voluntary servitude in a thankless attendance upon the great. Many are kept busy either in the pursuit of other men's fortune or in complaining of their own. Many, following no fixed aim, shifting and inconstant and dissatisfied, are plunged by their fickleness into plans that are ever new. Some have no fixed principle by which to direct their course, but fate takes them unawares while they lull and yawn. So surely does it happen that I cannot doubt the truth of that utterance which the greatest of poets delivered with all the seeming of an oracle. The part of life we really live is small. We waste our lives because we are confused about what is actually valuable we value money and land, which are worthless, but waste time, which is the only thing we own. 
Land and money come and go with the whim of fortune, but time can never be regained when lost or repaid when given. We are prone to so freely dispose of our time that even those who live a hundred years will have wasted almost every day and every hour of it. Though all the brilliant intellects of the ages were to concentrate upon this one theme, never could they adequately express their wonder at this dense darkness of the human mind. Men do not suffer anyone to seize their estates, and they rush to stones and arms, if there is even the slightest dispute about the limit of their lands, yet they allow others to trespass upon their life. Nay, they themselves even lead in those who will eventually possess it. No one is to be found who is willing to distribute his money, yet among how many does each one of us distribute his life? In guarding their fortune, men are often close-fisted, yet when it comes to the matter of wasting time, in the case of the one thing in which it is right to be miserly, they show themselves most prodigal. And so, I should like to lay hold upon someone from the company of older men and say, I see that you have reached the farthest limit of human life. You are pressing hard upon your 100th year, or are even beyond it. Come now, recall your life and make a reckoning. Consider how much of your time was taken up with a moneylender, how much with a mistress, how much with a patron, how much with a client, how much in wrangling with your wife, how much in punishing your slaves, how much in rushing about the city on social duties, Add the diseases which we have caused by our own acts. Add, too, the time that has lain idle and unused. You will see that you have fewer years to your credit than you count. Look back in memory and consider when you ever had a fixed plan, how few days have passed as you had intended, when you were ever at your own disposal, when your face ever wore its natural expression, when your mind was ever unperturbed, what work you have achieved in so long a life. How many have robbed you of life when you were not aware of what you were losing? How much was taken up in useless sorrow, in foolish joy, in greedy desire, in the allurements of society? How little of yourself was left to you? You will perceive that you are dying before your season. In that case, we should spend our valuable time learning how to live and how to die. What does that mean in real life? Commit to becoming wise and learning philosophy. Spend your time with wise people who will teach you, not on politics, ICS, social media, or porn. Cut ties with the things that don't matter and fill them with the things that do. Do philosophy first. Make it your priority, because without it, you H. Luckily for us, fortune has chosen to make all the wisdom of the ages available to us and given us many wise people to take as teachers. If only we get our priorities straight. Of all men, they alone are at leisure who take time for philosophy. They alone really live, for they are not content to be good guardians of their own lifetime only. They annex every age to their own. All the years that have gone before them are an addition to their store. Unless we are most ungrateful, all those men, glorious fashioners of holy thoughts, were born for us. For us, they have prepared a way of life. By other men's labors, we are led to the sight of things most beautiful that have been wrested from darkness and brought into light. From no age are we shut out. We have access to all ages, and if it is our wish, by greatness of mind, to pass beyond the narrow limits of human weakness, there is a great stretch of time through which we may roam. We may argue with Socrates, we may doubt with Charides, find peace with Epicurus, overcome human nature with the Stoics, exceed it with the Cynics. Since nature allows us to enter into fellowship with every age, why should we not turn from this paltry and fleeting span of time and surrender ourselves with all our soul to the past, which is boundless, which is eternal, which we share with our betters. Avoid unwholesome things. Another useful way to think about this is through the concept of wholesome and unwholesome things and places. Just as pestilential places assail even the strongest constitution, 
So there are some places which are also so unwholesome for a healthy mind, which is not yet quite sound though recovering from its ailment. We are just starting down the road of recovery, so it is important to be aware of the many distractions and temptations that surround us. To stay on this path, we must avoid environments and individuals that might, whether intentionally or not, lure us away from our virtuous goals. This includes being selective about the information we consume. Much of what is found in books, sports, television, and particularly in the realms of social media, politics, and pornography, is designed to stir our passions and distract us from meaningful contemplation. In the modern world, we are increasingly drawn into parasocial relationships, one-sided interactions where we might find ourselves spending more time with influencers, politicians, or podcast hosts than with actual people in our lives. Interestingly, the Stoics were ahead of their time in embracing a form of this concept. They cultivated relationships, albeit one-sided, with the greatest minds of the past. This is an approach we would do well to emulate, choosing our mentors wisely and ensuring that our digital interactions enrich rather than detract from our pursuit of virtue. Thinking about death. Do you, however, always think on death in order that you may never fear it? The fear of our own death is the ultimate power that fortune holds over us. It is our only real adversary. If we rise to its challenge and conquer it, we will free ourselves from the problems of life. And if we do not, we will never truly find freedom, no matter what else we do. To the Stoics, if the threat of death or of being killed prevents you from doing what you know is right, you are not free. Think on death. In saying this, he bids us think on freedom. He who has learned to die has unlearned slavery. He is above any external power, or at any rate, he is beyond it. What terrors have prisons and bonds and bars for him? His way out is clear. There is only one chain that binds us to life, and that is the love of life. The chain may not be cast off, but it may be rubbed away, so that when necessity shall demand, nothing may hinder us from being ready to do at once that which at some time we are bound to do. Too strong a love of life compromises our values and courage towards death fortifies them. There are many things we ought not to do even under mortal threat, but that we will if we incorrectly value our living over our living well. We ought not to kill, betray, bear false witness or sacrifice our freedom. We should walk the path of virtue even onto the gallows. We must remember not only that our lives could end today, but that the lives of our family and friends could as well. Fortune is a monster and will seek to bring down the person who has escaped her power by assaulting their loved ones. We must show the same courage with others as we do with ourselves, which can be an even greater challenge. Therefore, let us continually think as much about our own mortality as about that of all those we love. In former days, I ought to have said, my friends, Serenus is younger than I, but what does that matter? He would naturally die after me, but he may precede me. It was just because I did not do this that I was unprepared when fortune dealt me the sudden blow. Now is the time for you to reflect not only that all things are mortal, but also that their mortality is subject to no fixed law. Whatever can happen at any time can happen today. Finish your life every day. There is indeed a limit fixed for us, just where the remorseless law of fate has fixed it. But none of us knows how near he is to this limit. Therefore, let us so order our minds as if we had come to the very end. Let us postpone nothing. Let us balance life's account every day. The greatest flaw in life is that it is always imperfect and that a certain part of it is postponed. One who daily puts the finishing touches to his life is never in want of time. And yet, from this want arise fear and a craving for the future, which eats away the mind. There is nothing more wretched than worry over the outcome of future events. 
As to the amount or the nature of that which remains, our troubled minds are set aflutter with unaccountable fear. Therefore, my dear Lucilius, begin at once to live and count each separate day as a separate life. He who has thus prepared himself, he whose day, daily life, has been a rounded whole, is easy in his mind. But those who live for hope alone find that the immediate future always slips from their grasp and that greed steals along in its place and the fear of death, a curse which lays a curse upon everything else. We need to face the fact that death is inevitable and start living each day as if it were the last. We need to stop putting off living because we don't know what the future holds. This habit only makes us fearful and wanting and takes away from our current practice of being patient. Immersing yourself in the original texts of the Stoic philosophers is important if you want to change your life through philosophy. Understanding their teachings firsthand is the basis of this philosophical journey. After taking in their wisdom, the next step is to think about how these lessons relate to your own life and write about them. As Seneca says, we should study Stoicism like a bee. Reading, I hold, is indispensable, primarily to keep me from being satisfied with myself alone. And besides, after I have learned what others have found out by their studies, to enable me to pass judgment on their discoveries and reflect upon discoveries that remain to be made. Reading nourishes the mind and refreshes it when it is wearied with study. Nevertheless, this refreshment is not obtained without study. We ought not to confine ourselves either to writing or to reading. The one continuous writing will cast a gloom over our strength and exhaust it. The other will make our strength flabby and watery. It is better to have recourse to them alternately and to blend one with the other, so that the fruits of one's reading may be reduced to concrete form by the pen. We also, I say, ought to copy these bees and sift whatever we have gathered from a varied course of reading, for such things are better preserved if they are kept separate. Then, by applying the supervising care with which our nature has endowed us, in other words, our natural gifts, we should so blend those several flavors into one delicious compound that even though it betrays its origin, yet it nevertheless is clearly a different thing from that when it came. This is what we see nature doing in our own bodies without any labor on our part. So it is with the food which nourishes our higher nature. We should see to it that whatever we have absorbed should not be allowed to remain unchanged, or it will be no part of us. We must digest it, otherwise it will merely enter the memory and not the reasoning power. It's not enough to just understand Stoicism's philosophy, we need to really incorporate it into the way we think. To do this, you need to do two things, read and write. First, feed your mind with the writings of the great Stoic thinkers. Then, do reflective writing that combines their ideas with your own. A suggested reading order is to start with Seneca's Letters from a Stoic, then move on to others. We should try to remember this at all times, so we can remember that not even the next hour is guaranteed. Thinking about death helps us prepare for the worst that can happen to ourselves and our loved ones. Focusing on the next hour rather than a longer period of time is crucial because its brevity compels us to apply the dichotomy of control in this moment, concentrating solely on what is within our power here and now. Practice justice now. Be wise and good and kind now. Possess tranquility of mind now. Part 9. The Happy Life. When everything works out. When we are considering a happy life, you cannot answer me as though, after a division of the house, this view has most supporters because, for that very reason, it is the worst of the two. The Stoic's life is supposed to look grim, with the Stoic courageously enduring hardship sometimes. Things aren't going so well with people that the majority should choose the better path. The more people do something, the worse it's likely to be. So, let's not ask what is most commonly done, but what is best for us 
and will bring us eternal happiness, not what the vulgar, who are the worst possible representatives of truth, like. To get to virtue and the happiness that comes with it, the best life involves putting the whole system together, making philosophy your daily priority and fighting against vice head on. It also means always keeping the dichotomy of control in mind and living with wisdom, treating everyone you meet like family and refusing to be separate from virtue. Living this way leads to high happiness, which comes with it. In the end, it doesn't matter if I say that the highest good is a mind that hates luck and enjoys virtue, or if I say that it is an unconquerable strength of mind that knows the world well, is kind, and shows a lot of respect and kindness to those it comes into contact with. We could also say that a person is happy if he or she only knows good and bad in the form of good or bad minds, if they value honor and are happy with their own virtue, if they don't get pumped up or down by good or bad luck, if they only know good that they can give themselves, and if their real pleasure comes from hating pleasures. This idea can be expressed in many different ways without changing its meaning. What stops us from saying that a happy life is a mind that is free, upright, undaunted, and steadfast beyond the influence of fear or desire, that thinks nothing good except honor and nothing bad except shame, and that sees everything else as a bunch of meaningless details that can't add or take away anything. People who follow these principles must always be happy, and their happiness must come from above, because they are content with what they have and don't want any more pleasures than the ones they can get at home. Isn't he right to let these pleasures balance out the small, silly, and short-lived movements of their poor body? The day they become proof against pleasure, they also become proof against pain. See, on the other hand, what a bad and guilty master man is who is controlled by pleasures and pains, those most unreliable and passionate of masters. We must escape them into freedom, which will give us nothing but disdain for luck. But if we do reach it, then those priceless blessings will come to us. The peace of a mind at rest in a safe place, its high thoughts, and its steady lying. It is important to remember that the Stoic's happiness comes from avoiding pleasure, not from seeking it. Pleasure depends on luck, which makes it the opposite of secure. The Stoic's happiness comes from virtue alone, which can't be shaken. Why pair two things that are so different and even incompatible? Virtue is high, sublime, royal, unconquerable and never-ending, while pleasure is low, slavish, weak and short-lived. The best things never change and the highest good never ends. This is because a right-thinking mind never changes or hates itself and the best things never go through any changes. But pleasure dies just as quickly as it charms us. It doesn't have much scope, so it quickly cloys and tires us out and fades away as soon as its first imp impulse is over. In fact, we can't depend on things that change. The Stoic doesn't practice philosophy to get happiness. She does it to pursue virtue alone. She is like a jealous lover who won't let rivals for her attention. Happiness comes as a result of virtue, as a blessing bestowed upon those who gain her favor. It only works in that direction. The intentions of the practitioner are very important here, so it can't be faked or gotten quickly. You will be happy, but only after you become good. But says our adversary, you yourself only practice virtue because you hope to obtain some pleasure from it. In the first place, even though virtue may afford US pleasure, still, we do not seek after her on that account, for she does not bestow this, but bestows this to boot. Nor is this the end for which she labors, but her labor wins this also, although it be directed to another end, as in a tilled field when plowed for corn, some flowers are found amongst it. And yet though these posies may charm the eye, all this labor was not spent in order to produce them. The man who sowed the field had another object in view, 
he gained this over and above it. So, pleasure is not the reward or the cause of virtue, but comes in addition to it. Nor do we choose virtue because she gives us pleasure, but she gives us pleasure also if we choose her. The highest good lies in the act of choosing her and in the attitude of the noblest minds, which, when once it has fulfilled its function and established itself within its own limits, has attained to the highest good and needs nothing more. For there is nothing outside of the whole any more than there is anything beyond the end. You are asking for something more than the highest good, so when you ask me what I seek after virtue, I answer, herself, because she has nothing better to offer. She is her own reward. Does this not seem great enough when I tell you that the highest good is unwavering mental strength, kindness, wisdom, good judgment, freedom, harmony, and beauty? Do you still ask me for something more than that? To become good, you have to live a hypocritical life at first, knowing how you should live, but not being able to do it. This will likely get the attention of mean people who will see your desire to get better as a threat. Bad people don't want anyone to be good. You talk one way and live another, our enemy says. You most spiteful of creatures, you who always show the bitterest hatred to the best of men. I speak of virtue, not of myself, and when I blame vices, I first blame my own. Spite, however deeply steeped in venom, shall not keep me back from what is best. In the next book, Seneca continues to warn us not to be too hard on ourselves. He says we should talk out loud and then try to live up to our bold words. We might not be able to do it right away or even after a long time of trying, but that shouldn't stop us from going for the right goal. So, you have no reason to misunderstand the honorable, brave, and honest language that people who are studying wisdom use. First, keep in mind that a student of wisdom is not the same thing as a man who has become perfect in wisdom. The student of wisdom will tell you, in my speech, I express the most admirable sentiments, but I am still weltering amid countless ills. Right now, you shouldn't make me follow my rules. To become a great model, I am shaping myself and working to become the best person I can be. If I ever finish everything I set out to do, you can expect that my words and actions match up. The value of a stoic disposition. Some people are naturally more stoic than others, with traits like calmness, discipline, and an openness to new ideas. These traits can definitely make the path to wisdom easier but it's important to remember that Stoicism is a journey that anyone can take, regardless of their natural disposition. If you look at two buildings that are the same height and grandeur, but have different foundations, you can see that the first one has made more progress than the second. The first one is built on perfect ground, so the process of erection goes smoothly. The second one, on the other hand, has problems with its foundations, because they were sunk into soft, shifting ground, which took a lot of work to get to the solid rock. Men's personalities are the same way. Some are flexible and easy to control, while others have to be worked out by hand and are completely used in building their roots. The other, I believe, has deserved better of himself. He who has triumphed over the meanness of his own nature and has not gently led himself but has wrestled his way to wisdom. Seneca describes a distinctive way for Stoics to be happy that is different from the common ideas of pleasure and success. This happiness comes from a life dedicated to virtue, where true joy is found in the pursuit of wisdom, ethical living, and self-mastery. It's about facing life's challenges with a calm mind, finding joy in our relationships with others, and focusing on the things that really matter. Seneca stresses that true contentment comes from with. Part 10. How to turn to Stoicism. I have not arrived at perfect soundness of mind. Indeed, I never shall arrive at it. I compound preventative rather than remedies for my gout, and I am satisfied if it comes at a rarer interval and does not shoot as painfully as your feet. 
which are lame. I realized I needed a philosophy of life. I grew up in a nice Christian church, but stopped believing in God when I was in high school. I was an angry atheist for a while after that. But as I got older, I realized that without school or religion, I didn't have anywhere to make friends or feel like I belonged. So I calmed down and joined a few secular groups, but I never really found the community I was looking for. That's when Stoicism seemed like the next best thing to try. I think it's hard to live without a philosophy of life. It's hard to know if you are a good person and if you are living your life well. It's hard to feel connected to the people around you and to the world. And it leaves you without an answer when that voice in the night tells you that life is pointless, you're going to die, and all your suffering has been for nothing. Earlier in my life, I experienced depression and panic attacks that lasted until I finally found relief through the combination of control meditation and cognitive behavioral therapy. Either way, I had to know. I think of Stoicism as a lost art. Well-functioning philosophies of life, like the major world religions, are very complicated social machines. They give us many valuable things that we can't get on our own. They give us contexts that help us find meaning and purpose in life. They give us moral frameworks that help us build communities and interact with others in ways that hurt others. If Stoicism is to fulfill its promises, it must offer the same. This would be possible if we were students of the original school, listening to lectures under the Stoa and immersed in the culture of ancient Athens. Without a thorough understanding of how all the parts work, we often end up with worldviews that are superficial or that fail us when we need them most. This is especially true of Stoicism. Stoicism seems to be living up to its claims in my life so far. I haven't tamed all of my fears and desires, but I have made a lot of progress on some of them, more than I ever thought possible. This makes me think that Seneca's system might actually work. At this point, I think the chances are high enough that it will that it's worth putting in a few more years of hard work to find out for sure. Even with a lifetime of commitment, most of us will never reach perfect tranquility of mind, but the progress we should be able to make will put us far ahead of the average person. Stoicism is not something you learn overnight. It takes a sustained effort, making real changes to your thoughts and actions over a long period of time. The different levels of Stoicism. Stoicism has some very high goals for its followers, but it is also realistic about where we start and how little progress we can expect to make. It's a long road and the highest ranks are only for people who are naturally good at it or who started training hard when they were young. But for the rest of us, the progress we can make is more than we can imagine at first. For the past few years, I've been learning Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, a modern martial art that is like a mix of Judo and wrestling with chokes and joint locks added. You can't punch or kick, but it's full speed and full contact. In some ways, it's been a lot like learning Stoicism. For starters, it's really, really hard, especially at the beginning. You have to unlearn a lot of bad habits and learn new ones. First, you spend a lot of time learning all the techniques for either Stoicism or Jiu Jitsu. Then, you spend even more time focusing on the ones that work best for you and becoming an expert at them. You have to trust the system at first because you can't see where you're going. You might not even be able to see the first rest stop. It also takes a lot of time and work before you realize how bad you are at both of them. When it comes to jujitsu, there is a saying that you spend the first year learning how to win 99% of the fights and the next 20 years training to win the last 1%. This fits well with Stoicism if you think of that last 1% as becoming dead. There is a belt system in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that shows how skilled a person is, and the same could be used for Stoicism. Seneca describes three classes for people who have made some progress in their practice, but have not yet reached the level of Stoic Sage. You ask, are there no levels of happiness below your happy man? 
Is there a straight drop right below wisdom? No, I don't think so. Someone who makes progress is still counted with the fools, but he is far away from them. There are both people who are making progress and large areas that are getting in the way. Some scientists think they can be broken down into three groups. The first ones to come are those who haven't reached knowledge yet, but have already earned a spot close. But even things that are close are still outside. If you ask me, these are guys who have already given up all their vices and interests, who have learned what to believe, but their faith hasn't been put to the test yet because they haven't done anything good yet. They can't go back to the mistakes they got away from from now on. It's already too late for them to go back from where they are now, but they don't know it yet. As I remember saying in another letter, they don't know what they know. Now they have been given the chance to enjoy their good, but not yet to be sure of it. People in the group I've been talking about, men who are making progress, are said to have gotten over mental illnesses, but not yet the emotions. They are still on shaky ground though, because only the Holy One who has completely gotten rid of evil is safe. But the only person who has truly been free is the one who has chosen knowledge over ignorance. The second group is made up of people who have given up the worst things about their mind and their interests, but they are not completely immune because they can still go back to how they were. The third class is safe from many vices, especially the big ones, but not all of them. They've gotten away from things like greed, but they still feel angry. Though lust doesn't bother them as much as it used to, desire still does. They no longer want anything, but they still fear it, and because they are afraid, they give in to some things even though they are strong enough to handle others. They don't fear death, but they are scared of pain. Let's think about this for a moment. If we get into this class, everything will be fine. In order to reach the second stage, we need to be very lucky with our native gifts and learn a lot all the time. But not even the third kind should be looked down upon. Think about all the bad things you see around you. Look at how every crime is shown, how much evil gets worse every day, and how common sins are in both the home and the community. So, you can see that we are making a lot of progress if we are not counted among the lowest. Black belts, trainees, in jiu-jitsu, stay at this level for about two years before going up to blue belts, proficient. Seneca has trained for many more years to get his third type of belt, the blue belt. They can then move up to purple, brown and black belts, which are the second, first and second types, respectively. And the calm, wise man. Black belts and teachers are not to be messed with. It's said that 90% of people who start jiu-jitsu quit before they get their blue belt. I bet that's about the same percentage of people who quit stoicism. But we could make our whole lives better if we could just keep going and work hard for a few years. It's likely that most of us will never get past the third type, but getting that far is still a long way from heaven to hell. Stoic practice. Get into the beat or walk the tight RPP. When things happen that throw you off, go back to yourself right away and try not to lose the rhythm more than you have to. If you keep going back to the rhythm, you'll understand it better. When done correctly by an experienced stoic, the hours between getting up and going to bed should all feel the same. It's good to train your mind by setting goals in the morning and thinking about them at night. Between those two points, we should spend our time practicing virtue and avoiding the traps and temptations of wealth. That's what Marcus Aurelius called this state, the beat. When things are going well for me, it does feel like that. But most of the time, being calm is more like walking on a wire with a tight RPP. First, you have to get to a high place. Then you have to stay balanced all day while luck keeps coming at you from all sides. Sometimes you'll lose your balance and fall, but you have to get back up, climb again, and get back out on the rope. The goal is to not fall at any point between your planning in the morning and your review in the evening. It looks like it will take a while. 
So how are we going to do this? I get on the tight RPP, get up early, relax, read or listen to a little stoicism, write or be creative. Your process may be different. Always keep this in mind. I could die today. Remember it first thing in the morning and lots of times during the day. Not even the next hour is certain. Stoicism is the only thing I can do right now. On my shoulder, Seneca is watching everything I do and think, and he wants me to succeed. How I connect with people around me and with the rest of the world. Make sure I'm in the right relationship with anyone that comes to mind, especially people I'm mad at. As I go about my day, stay on the tight RPP. Think about what virtue is and how I can show it. In what way can I worship her today out of superstition? Being aware of the present moment, I try to keep an eye on my thoughts all the time and fight any hurtful or illogical ones as soon as they come up. The choice of control. Only set goals for myself. Don't care about things that are out of my control. I don't always have as much control as I think I do. The good things that have happened to me and how grateful I am. How can I help other people who deserve it? If you're having bad thoughts about the past or the present, try thinking of other good things. Remember that you can't change the past or the future. Make sure that's where all of my attention is going. Wants. Remember what is really good. The mind wants what it already has. Fears. Think about what is really bad. A mind that lets its fears take over. Do something about the things you can control when you feel stressed. Practice not caring about the other people. Take 10 to 15 minutes during lunch to write in a silent book. In the nights, work out, write, be artistic, or get things done. Make easy, good food. Write down what went well and what didn't today. What else could I have done? What bad habit did you break today? What sin have you looked at? How are you better than them? Write down the good things that have happened to me and why I'm thankful for them. Think about how I can get them back next time. What was the smartest idea I got today? What is Seneca's daily sum and share for himself? Get yourself something that will protect you from misfortunes like poverty, death and more. And once you've gone over a lot of ideas, pick one to really think about that day. From all the things I've read, this is how I do things. I take a certain part for myself. Only time will tell if Stoicism lives up to its claims. The answer might not become clear until we face death and try to deal with it on an equal level. But I can say for sure that the times I practice Stoicism, when I remember my goal and think about things like knowledge, justice, moderation and courage, are time well spent. Most of the time, these are my best times, and even when they're hard, they never overwhelm me. It is hard to put into practice the idea that living in the present is the best way to approach life, even if you mentally understand that it is. Seneca said, the present alone can make no man wretched. I believe that this is true. For some reason, we all want to live in the past or the future, but putting the present moment first is the best way to show the dichotomy of control. Although this truth is hard to understand, I think we become truly wise in the stoic sage sense the moment we see it in a way that we can't miss. It seems like this is a real discovery that people can have. It means that we are using our thinking in the best way possible and the end result should be the happiest state a person can reach. The last part is just a guess but being able to feel this way seems like it's true. To find out, you have to keep working and try to make the most of every hour.